screen uh, because yes. cutting into my head. good afternoon uh, dear uh, friends it's uh, great to uh, welcome you all on this uh, fourth and penultimate session of uh, direct tax uh, refresher course we have been uh, we had a long journey from past uh, four week this is fourth week and uh, uh, we have got wonderful uh, uh, participants and equally uh, uh, wonderful speakers who are there today we also have uh, uh, galaxy of speakers and uh, brain trust to uh, uh, guide you on the direct tax refresher course uh, so uh, i'll uh, without wasting much time i'll just request uh, uh, my regional council colleague hitesh bhai to uh, introduce a first speaker of the day hitesh bhai over to you thank you thank you very much jayesh bhai and uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to introduce advocate sir rai sir sir is the commerce graduate and the uh, chartered accountant also by profession and he is practicing as the advocate sir was the junior to mr dinesh vyas advocate and thereafter to mr v h patel advocate for almost 2 years each and he has commenced independent independent practice as a counsel in the year 1984 and sir was the sir was the past president of the itat bar association mumbai and he has appeared in a wide variety of cases many of them being of far reaching importance sir is the regular speaker contributor at the various conferences seminars meeting etc held by a host of the organizations and today the sir will be dealing and discussing with about the recent important judgment It will have the impact on the income tax actually. So may I request, sir, Jayesh Bhai, VP sir has joined. It, it seems, sir, Jayesh Bhai. Yeah. Uh, uh, today uh, we have uh, been. Uh, Hello, VP sir, uh, Devashish Mitra sir. Uh, sorry for some technical glitch in my office, but I can see you all of you now. Uh, sir that's great we are just waiting you so uh, devashish mitra sir vice president we are uh, honored today to have you in our direct tax refresher course so uh, it's indeed uh, a pleasure for all of uh, wrc members and the participants over here uh, to have uh, you with uh, us and uh, we would uh, request you to sir kindly uh, uh, say a few words to our members and uh, guide the participants sir Thank you very much, Jayesh ji, and a very good evening to all of you, to all the see, uh, you know, learned professionals whom I see on the screen. Uh, all of you make us so proud because when you share knowledge with uh, all the delegates, with all those chartered accountants, and some of them are young, you know, you do a, such a great service to the profession. Uh, you see, because you know, this profession has this unique, uh, you know, concept called continuing professional education uh, (CPE). we have this direct tax refresher courses that we have and it is not only restricted to direct tax we have indirect tax we have so many other areas to go and you see i am very happy that wirc is organizing programs on this very important topic of direct tax those of us who follow me a bit they all know that i do deal mainly in corporate laws and accounting and auditing standards but you know from the time i did my article shift 30 years back Uh, direct tax has been something which has i have been is extremely extremely fond of and i sometimes surprise my council colleagues by you see you know uh, you see mentioning section 1433 of the income tax act 1431 148 then 1023c section 11 section 12 i surprise them very much but what has happened also in the recent times is you know how we are trying to be relevant let me tell you 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 are aware that you see the 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 uh, the the income tax portal has some glitches now all of us are aware and many of us we have also faced lot of complaints from this thing so what happened was this how institute has tried to be relevant the finance ministry approached us that how can we help you see in ensuring that these glitches are reduced to whatever extent possible we created a task force of seven chartered accountants and these chartered accountants were you see picked up from all over india and uh, the thing the 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 criteria was you know it is not the knowledge of the act 
but you know something maybe all of you don't do even i don't do how much how how many how conversant are you in uploading returns or how much you go to the site because i'm sure all of us we don't do that somebody else in the office does so we wanted that those kind of people who can see you know uh, tell the enforcers that look here we have a problem here we have a problem we picked up seven and we gave them intense training from direct tax committee and then on the 22nd they made presentation each one of them had five minutes and they made presentation and later on at about that presentation started at 11 they all the infosys top brass was there and that 12 30 the union finance minister union finance minister joined us and let me tell you uh, she was profuse in her praise for the institute and the way we have helped uh, the government in trying to overcome the glitches. We were not at all critical, let me tell you, when you made the presentation. Not critical of Infosys, not critical of, we only had this, you know, constructive criticism. We said that here we feel that there is a problem. I think, you see, Infosys has to do something here. So we had a list of more than 30 and we told them. And today, let me tell you, all these seven people, who are the members of the task force are very much in demand from the income tax department. Yesterday, I believe this is, they were all called by the income tax department saying that, tell us what were the points you, you discussed on that day. So the point, and you must have also seen the press release given by the CBDT where they have praised the institute, institute's efforts. So you see, what we are trying to do is this stay relevant in a, in a very fast, uh, very fast changing and dynamic scenario. And then what is, I'm sure faceless assessment must have been discussed. Now we know that this, the way faceless assessment has come, we are all used to in-person assessments. The way faceless assessment has come, I know we know that this is going to be a challenge for professionals. Their drafting skills will be, will, will be tested, their knowledge will be tested. Right, so knowledge and drafting skills will be both tested. The direct tax committee is now doing everything possible to see that we have more than more programs on faceless assessments and two publications are being brought out by the institute. I speak to you from the, my office at Delhi and let me tell you that we are doing everything possible to see that the knowledge of the membership is always you know, enhanced in a, at regular intervals at regular intervals that they never remain static because we believe that is the only way how the profession can go forward and contribute uh, as a partner in nation building. I don't want to take much time except to again express my happiness for the program that has been organized by WIRC and again express my thankfulness to all the faculties for having shared that their knowledge and insights with the membership. So I wish all of you and the WIRC all the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was uh, indeed a very enlightening session and uh, uh, under your leadership, under the leadership of Nihar Bhai, uh, it, you have done exceedingly well and the way in which uh, the FM has uh, complemented uh, ICI, WRC, it's really commendable. And uh, we can uh, expect that uh, uh, with the help of our institute, uh, that income tax glitches will uh, be sorted out uh, very soon. And uh, I can see that uh, we have uh, a very unique combination today. Like we have Hitesh Bhai, uh, like he's a uh, uh, Hiteshi of everyone. We have uh, Hero with us. We have uh, Brahma Asaf, Sanjeev Brahme, we have Vijay Vinar, we have Manish, uh, wherein uh, everybody is like Manko Jeetne Wala. Then we have uh, you, Mitra, friends. So it's it's indeed a very great combination. Uh, sir, we have uh, uh, WRC has uh, e publication on charitable and religious trust, which we would like uh, you to release. The, we are thankful to the contributors Vijay Joshi ji, CA Suhas Malankar, CA Sanjeev Brahme, CA Aditya Surte, CA Aditya Seema Pradeep, CA Kiran Gharkar, who have taken a lot of pain to bring this uh, publication on uh, charitable and religious trust. It contains each and 
everything which is required uh, by members right from the formation registration various laws case laws everything is there in this uh, e publication so we request you sir with your worthy hands let us uh, release this uh, book on charitable and religious trust fantastic my hearty congratulations to all of you and of so you can to just the... you can just have a click on the it will be opening that yeah i am just clicking yeah sure okay okay very good super sir what a i am extremely disciplined let me tell you very good and today charitable and religious trusts uh, this the laws you see affecting them seem to be so so very much important and you know that the due date for submission of form number 10 has just been extended so you are all aware of that so you see fantastic all congratulations to wirc for having got the out this very important publication thank, thank you, you sir and uh, sir we acknowledge our gratitude for uh, you being uh, addressing our uh, members thank you you were in meeting but then still you take out took out some time for addressing the participants and members over here we uh, really thanks to you sir thank you very much and all the thank very you. best to all of you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you uh now uh, friends continuing with the uh, session we have uh, the wonderful introduction of uh, a very renowned personality advocate he, uh, advocate and chartered accountant uh, hero rai sir by hitesh bhai so uh, uh, i would request uh, hero sir to kindly uh, uh, give guideline give uh, uh, information on recent important uh, judgments to our members over to you sir yeah chairman mr manish gadia dignitaries on the panel friends i hope i'm audible clearly yes sir right a very good afternoon to each one of you my thanks to the wrc for inviting me over this afternoon for the wrc uh, dtrc today i shall be dealing with the topic of certain recent important judgments i may point out that uh, this is a topic i quite frequently speak on on the bca society platform and in fact i did recently speak on this very same topic on the 14th of april and in fact immediately thereafter i was approached by wrc and despite my request you know they still insisted that i should speak on the same topic so here i am on the topic of recent important judgments and if some of you who have heard that talk feel that some of the decisions are repeated because obviously they will be so i may please be excused i will start with some supreme court decisions then i will come to some bombay high court decisions time permitting i would go to some other high court decisions because i am told i have time up to 5 o'clock i may clarify that when we consider decisions we are nobody to comment upon or criticize the said judgments i will therefore refrain from doing so my experience of about 4 decades has taught me one thing and that is that it is not enough just to know of a particular decision it makes sense to go into the logic the reasoning behind that decision and if you do so that will really sharpen your power of reasoning your intellect really gets sharpened if you go into the logic and the reason and of course this will help you in good stead okay when you work on matters subsequently maybe completely different matters but yes you have trained yourself to apply your mind in certain manner and that is where considering decisions is very useful with these preliminary remarks i will now come to the decisions i may mention that these are not in any particular order of importance we will start with the decision of the supreme court in 426 itr 289 which is shri choudhury transport company versus itr 
this is a somewhat straightforward decision, but I have taken it for the reason that it has quite wide applicability. This decision deals with various aspects of Section 40A1A, which, as you all know, is a disallowance provision in respect of expenses where you have not complied with the TDS obligations. The first aspect this decision deals what deals with is what we called the payable argument. What I mean is, if you read the section, it said and it says any sum payable by way of interest, etc or any sum payable as it now stands on which tax is deductible. Any sum payable. Assessees used to stress upon this word payable and therefore used to say and argue that this disallowance would apply only to those cases where the amount is still payable. In respect of amounts which have already been paid, the disallowance under Section 40A1A would not apply. This argument has been negated by the Supreme Court. And it says that the expression payable is used in the section in a descriptive manner so as to indicate the type of payments that are covered by the disallowance does not refer to whether the payment has been actually made or not. Therefore, this argument was rejected by the Supreme Court. Yet another issue which was decided was that many of you would know that this provision was originally a 100% disallowance provision. Namely, 100% of the expenditure was disallowed. There was an amendment made by the Finance Number no. 2 Act of 2014, with effect from 1415, whereby this disallowance was reduced from 100% to 30%. So the assessee in this case argued its assessment year was AY 2005 6. They said this amendment should also be made applicable to my case, and therefore the disallowance should be restricted only to 30%. Supreme Court says no. This amendment was made by the Finance Number no. 2 Act 2014 with effect from 1415 and therefore would apply only from AY 1516 onwards. You could not get the benefit of the reduced disallowance for an earlier year. There were certain decisions which the SSE had relied upon, and the Supreme Court distinguished those decisions and said that the principles dealing with curative amendments relating to procedural aspects could not be applied to the amendment of a substantive nature. This amendment reducing the disallowance from 100 to 30 is a substantive provision and nothing procedural about it. Therefore, it would not apply to the earlier years. Yet another aspect, the facts in this case were that the assessee, as the name suggests, was a transport contractor. It entered into an agreement with a cement company to transfer the goods of that cement company all across India. It did not have enough trucks of its own and therefore engaged the services of other transport operators to whom it made payments. The issue arose whether qua those payments which the assessee made to the other transport contractors were liable to reduction of tax under Section 194C2, namely payments to subcontractors. The assessee argued that it is merely a facilitator or an intermediary between the company and the other transport contractors. Supreme Court says nothing doing. The contract is between the assessee and the cement company. There is no privity of contract between the cement company and the other transport contractor. Responsibility to transport the goods was that of the assessee for which it entered into contracts with the other contractors who therefore became 
its subcontractors in terms of section 194 c because they were doing part of the work which the assessee was supposed to do and therefore 194 c2 was applicable and the dds was deducted as i said quite a straightforward decision but it has very wide applicability that is the reason i took it up the next 433 itr 295 supreme court dcit versus pepsi foods limited this deals with the grant of stay by the tribal as you are all aware section 254 2a empowers the tribunal to grant a stay this stay can extend up to 365 days and the third proviso says that if the appeal is not disposed of within 365 days the stay shall automatically lapse even if the delay in the disposal of the appeal is not attributable to the assessee this was what the third proviso said the constitutional validity of the third proviso came up for consideration before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that this provision is discriminatory because it does not distinguish between persons or assessees who are at fault and assessees who are not at fault. Even in the case of those assessees who are not at fault, they stay stands vacated. And therefore, this is discriminatory against them. It also went on to hold. this is arbitrary arbitrary in the sense if the department or the revenue in the state will stand vacating revenue or favor of the department this is therefore arbitrary arbitrary capricious irrational and disproportionate can you hear me for these two reasons it was discriminatory and it was arbitrary. It was held that this third proviso to section 254-2A is violative of Article 14 of the Constitution. And therefore, it was read down to say that the stay will stand vacated after 365 days only if the assessee is at fault. If the delay was attributable to the assessee, only in those cases after 365 days will the stay lapse. This decision, as you would appreciate, is very important and has a bearing in the case of all those assessees where stay has been granted and for some reason, which happens very often, the appeal could not be disposed of within the 365 days. Now, what will have to be done is you will have to go into the reasons as to why the appeal could not be disposed of within the 365 days and only if the delay was attributable to the SSC, only in that case would the state stand automatically vacated. This decision could also have an impact on what is now being touted as the faceless tribunal. As you are all aware, uh, Finance Act 21 has brought about or at least enabled the government to notify a faceless tribunal. The notification has not yet come, but as and when it comes, if and when it comes, the action will shift to the courts where this provision of faceless tribunal will be challenged. And several arguments which were made in the course of this decision will come to our aid. Say, for example, this decision said that because of this third proviso, the remedy of the assessee has become illusory. I think the same argument could apply even to a case of a faceless tribunal. How can decisions be made on the basis of written submissions without hearing?
thing necessities. Let's survey the scheme and see what happens. We come next to 423 ITR 267 Supreme Court, CIT versus Chetak Enterprises Private Limited. This deals with Section 80IA, that is Infrastructure Development Undertakings. Here the facts were that there was a firm which entered into an agreement with the state government for the construction of a road and after the completion of that construction, it was entitled to levy a toll. The construction of the road was completed on 27-3-2000 and the inauguration of the road was four days thereafter on 1st April 2000. In between these two dates, that is on 28-3-2000, the said firm was converted into a company under part 9 of the Companies Act. This all happened in the year ending March 2000. For the AY 2002-3, the SSC claimed the deduction under Section 80IA. And this was denied by the department on the ground that 80IA4 clause small Roman 1 conditions were not satisfied. Matter went up right to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court says, let's see what are the conditions of 80IA41. First, it says, the enterprise, that is the requirement of the clause, the enterprise carrying on the infrastructure activity should be owned by a company. Now, we were concerned with AY23, by which date, by virtue of part nine of the Companies Act, the firm stood converted into a company. All the assets of the, of the firm stood transferred to the company. And therefore, in the AY23 with which the court was concerned, this condition stood satisfied. That is, the enterprise carrying on the infrastructure activity was owned by a company. So this condition, the Supreme Court held, was satisfied. The second condition under the clause was that the assessee should have entered into an agreement with the state government. Now here the department argued that the agreement was entered into by the firm, whereas the deduction was claimed by the company. And the company is not the one who had entered into the agreement with the state government. Here also Supreme Court held in favor of the SSE. It said, one, that the agreement between the firm and the state government was clearly on the understanding that as and when the firm is converted into a company, the company will come in place of the firm. And this had actually happened. Once the part nine transfer took place, the company was brought into the picture by virtue of a communication to the state government and an acknowledgement and acceptance by them. And therefore, it was held that the agreement was set to be entered into by the company. And another very important argument which was accepted here was, if you saw the agreement, it said the firm includes in brackets, including assignees and successors. Therefore, relying upon these bracketed portions, which one normally finds in standard agreements, the Supreme Court held that look at the effect of this. Effect of this is that the firm includes the assignees and transferees. It would therefore include the company and therefore it satisfied the requirement of that particular clause. In this era of amalgamations, demergers, conversions, etc., this decision lays down important principles and can be very usefully relied upon. Fortunately, there is ATIA 12, which says that if the undertaking owned by the company is 
subject to an amalgamation or demerger then it is the amalgamated company or the resulting company which will continue to get the deduction fortunately this provision is there but in the facts of this case it could not apply because the ATIA 12 said when the undertaking of a company is transferred in the facts of this case it was the undertaking of the firm which was transferred and therefore ATIA 12 could not be resorted to by the SSC. This also brings to light and teaches us certain things, specifically the reliance on the bracketed portion, including assignees and transferees. See, when we were originally taught drafting either in CA or while we did law, while drafting agreements, we saw that there were certain standard phrases which were used. As you go by, you realize the meaning and importance of those standard phrases. And this is a classic example whereby something which you possibly never pay a great amount of attention to, but that clinches the issue. That bracketed portion is what clinched the issue. There's something contrary also. Very often while drafting a lot of our documents, we use expressions and terms which really we don't really understand the meaning of, but just as a matter of course, they are used. And that is the reason why I'm bringing this out. When we argue matters before the tribunal, we see very often grounds drafted saying that on the facts and in the circumstances of the case, the CIT appeal was not justified in confirming the disallowance. This is done in general on the facts and the circumstances of the case. My point is, this expression on the facts and in the circumstances of the case has a definite meaning and connotation. This is something we use when we file appeals to the High Court, where the jurisdiction of the High Court is restricted to substantial questions of law, either in a reference application or in an appeal under 260A. There it goes on the facts and the circumstances of the case. That means on the facts as they are found, the circumstances as they are found, we request the High Court to give a decision on the legal part. That means there is agreement on the facts on the circumstance of the case that is final. When we use this expression before the tribunal or the CIT appeal, it is absolutely incorrect because very often before the tribunal or the CIT appeal, we are challenging basic facts. Facts are not yet final. They are still being challenged. It is only the tribunal which is the final fact-finding authority. Final fact-finding authority. Only after that can you say on the facts and the circumstances of the case. Therefore, I would request please refrain using these expressions while drafting grounds to the tribunal or the CIT appeal for that matter. 424 ITR page 1. Supreme Court, Basir Ahmed Sisodia versus ITO. This is an interesting judgment. The facts were that there were certain credits in the books of the SSE who explained that these were credit balances due in respect of purchases made. In the course of the assessment proceedings, the SSE could not prove this by documentation. CIT appeal upheld the dis disallowance, tribunal upheld the addition, even High Court confirmed the addition, matter was before the Supreme Court. Before the Supreme Court, the SSE made an application to bring subsequent events on record. Now, what were the subsequent events? Penalty proceedings had been initiated in respect of this addition. And the matter went to the CIT appeal where the assessee had filed certain additional evidence. The matter was remanded to the AO. The affidavits of those parties were filed. The AO examined those parties. 12 out of 13 parties were examined by the AO. The identity was not doubted by the AO and he made no adverse comments as regards their version that they had sold goods to the SSE. Therefore, SSE established 
the credentials and the genuineness of this credit entry and therefore the CIT appeal deleted the matter. This matter became final. That is the CIT appeal penalty. The assessee relied upon this CIT appeal deletion of penalty before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has held that the penalty proceedings were the outcome of the assessment order. On the facts of this case, the factual basis on which the addition had been made no longer survived. The CIT appeal found that everything was genuine. Once that is so, there was no reason to sustain the addition. And therefore, the addition was deleted. Supreme Court very well also said that we are conscious of the fact that all this has happened in the course of the penalty proceedings. Despite that, the Supreme Court has taken this decision. This decision is therefore, to my mind, very useful in cases where, due to certain difficulties, assessees have not been able to file certain details. For whatever reason, there can be numerous amount of difficulties. The Supreme Court here has not gone into the technical aspects of additional evidence, etc., and has taken a very pragmatic view that the addition deserves to be deleted. Please appreciate, it is normally the other way around. If the addition is deleted, the penalty automatically goes. But this is a reverse case, where the penalty was deleted and thereafter the addition was deleted. I'm only sound a little note of caution that normally in the course of penalty proceedings, different considerations apply vis-a-vis -vis the considerations which apply in the course of assessment proceedings. And therefore, normally, merely because a penalty has been deleted does not mean that the addition should be deleted. The facts in this case were to be noted that in the course of the penalty proceedings, the genuineness of the credits stood proved and accepted by the department. That is the reason why the Supreme Court took the view which it did. Four thirty one ITR page one Mavilai Service Cooperative Bank Limited and others versus CIT. This is a decision which deals with section eighty P, which I am aware many of you may not really be very much interested in. But the reason why I have taken down taken this decision for discussion is that lay, this decision lays down certain important propositions, particularly regarding interpretation. First proposition, Supreme Court says that it is only the ratio descendantly, the ratio of a judgment, which is binding as a precedent. Just to explain this further, there was an earlier decision of the Supreme Court in Citizen Cooperative Society, which had laid down a few propositions as regards the interpretation of Section 80P. Thereafter, it ultimately held that since most of the assessee's business had been done illegally with nominal members, that assessee was not entitled to the deduction under Section 80P. The issue arose as to what is the ratio of this decision. And the Supreme Court made certain very profound observations, which I will just read out. It said, the statement of the principles of law applicable to the legal problems disclosed by the facts alone is the binding ratio of the case. The judgment based on the combined effect of the statement of the principles of law to the material facts of this case cannot be described as the ratio of the case. Means that the legal principles laid down were what the ratio was. The ultimate conclusion or what flowed from that, from those legal principles, was not the ratio decision. Therefore, the 
conclusion in that case that the SSC was not entitled to the deduction under ATP was not the ratio of that decision. It is only something which followed from the ratio. This was one. Number two, it laid down the proposition that a proviso cannot be used to cut down the language of the main enactment where the language of that main enactment is clear or to exclude by implication something which the main enactment includes. Simply stated, and this gets illustrated by what the Supreme Court held in that case, ATP A21 said that income arising from providing credit facility to the members was deductible under ATP. This is what ATP 2A1 says. Income arising from providing credit facilities to its members. ATP 4 was a kind of a proviso which laid down certain restrictions qua agricultural activities. The department says that therefore you would get the ATP 2A1 deduction only if you were giving loans to your members for agricultural activities. So the proviso was being sought to be used to limit ATP A1, the deduction permissible. Supreme Court said, by virtue of the principle laid down, it said this is not permissible. It is very clear in the language of the main enactment that is ATP A2A1 which said income arising from providing credit facilities to its members. There is no requirement that these credit facilities must be for agriculture. And therefore, even if these were not for agriculture, the assessee was entitled to it. Another important principle of interpretation which was laid down by this decision was that ATP is a beneficial provision which has been enacted to promote the cooperative movement in the country. And it therefore, this provision must be liberally and reasonably construed. And if there is any ambiguity, that ambiguity must be solved in favor of the assessing. This is a well-settled proposition, but of late due to certain observations in certain decisions, this principle had got a little diluted. Now, this decision of a three-judge bench lays down this principle and therefore gives us a lot of comfort as regards interpretation of provisions which provide certain reliefs. And the last proposition laid down by this decision was that same ATP 2A1 which say providing credit facilities to members. The department argued that you are providing credit facilities even to non-members and therefore you are not entitled to the deduction. Supreme Court said no. There is no requirement in that section that you should be solely engaged in providing credit facilities to your member. If that were so, I could understand. But there is no such requirement. So therefore, if you are doing both with members and non-members, Qua the component of your income which relates to your members, you would be entitled to the deduction under ATP. This principle can be expanded and applied to a whole host of decisions, whole host of situations. Say, for example, you would recollect ATIB 10 housing projects. There's a certain area, the section imposes a certain area limit. And what happens in cases where some of your flats in your project are of more than that area? This decision, the principles laid down by this decision would apply in that situation also to say that you would be entitled to the deduction qua the qualifying flats which are lesser than the area specified. There are in fact direct Supreme Court decisions also on this specific proposition. Four thirty two ITR four seventy one Supreme Court Engineering Analysis Center of Excellence Private Limited versus CIT. This decision is a very recent decision, and I think one of the most important decisions.
from the Supreme Court in recent times. This decision dealt with the issue whether payments for computer software constitute royalty under Section 916 or the relevant treaties. I will briefly bring out the important propositions laid down by this judgment. The relevant brief facts were that there were Indian end users or there were Indian distributors who made payments to the non-residents who were either the owners of the copyright or who were non-resident resellers. Payments were made to them for computer software. The issue arose whether this constitutes royalty under the treaty provisions as also section 916 which deems that income to accrue in India and therefore whether there was a liability to deduct TDS. The Supreme Court laid down several propositions. First, it dealt with Article 13 of the treaty. Article 13 of the treaty said, consideration for the use of or the right to use copyright of a literary work. Consideration for the use of or the right to use copyright of a literary work. There is an important difference between a right to reproduce and a right to use. When you give the right to reproduce, there is an element of use of the copyright. But when you are only giving the right to use and not the right to reproduce, there is no element of the copyright in it. Simple illustration which is given is that suppose there is an author of a book, he sells those rights to the publisher. That is a case where that payment would constitute royalty. But if say you and I buy that book from that publisher, what we are having is not the copyright. We are having only a copyrighted article. There's a difference between a copyright and a copyrighted article. Another example could be see the CD you buy or the DVD you buy in respect of movie songs or some such thing. Same thing, there's a difference between the copyright and the copyrighted article. The payments to be covered under Article 13 should be for the copyright, not for the copyrighted article. This is what it first held. Therefore, it was not covered by Article 13 of the treaty. Section 916 also which defined royalty. Even that was interpreted in a similar manner to say that it did not constitute royalty for the same reasons under 916 also. Further, it says, once a DTAA applies, the provisions of the act can apply only to the extent they are beneficial to the SSC. Therefore, if section 916 contained a broader definition of royalty, even if that be so that 916 covered royalty payments, these payments for computer software, even if it gave an expansive definition, the treaty would come to the aid of the SSC because the treaty was a beneficial provision. Next, it held that the liability to deduct TDS under Section 195 arises only if that income of the non resident is liable to tax in India. If there is no tax liability in India, there is no requirement of deducting TDS. And here it followed the very well considered decision of GE India 327 idea. It also held there was a doubt created by Pilcom's decision which came last year. A substantial doubt was created as if in the case of treaty cases, you would still only need the permission of the department only thereafter you could say that you are not liable to deduct tax. Otherwise, you are liable to deduct tax. That is what what's a reading of Pilcom's decision bringing out. That was creating a lot of difficulties and that was relied upon in this decision. 
Supreme Court has clarified that decision and explained that decision and distinguished it also in saying that you have to consider the provisions of the treaty to consider whether there is a liability to tax in India. And only if there is a liability under the treaty, then the question arises of deducting tax. A very important proposition laid down was also that the legislature should not expect the impossible from an assessee. This was in the context of explanation four, which was inserted in section 916 to expand the definition of royalty. This amendment was made by Finance Act 12 with retrospective effect from 1476. The Supreme Court said, how could during that interim period, the interregnum, how could the SSE envisage that you are going to come out with a broader definition of royalty and therefore I am supposed to have had the possibility to know that you are going to expand that and therefore in those earlier years I was liable to deduct it. The Supreme Court said this cannot be what legislatures do. You cannot expect an SSE to do the impossible. And the last one or two points which this decision laid down was the importance of the OECD commentary. They said, when your tax treaty is based on the OECD model, surely the OECD commentary has definite persuasive value. The assessees have a right to know as to where they stand when they're entering into their transaction and they can therefore certainly rely upon the OECD commentary which is available. Department also argued with reference to the reservations they had expressed with reference to certain portions of the commentary. The Supreme Court considered this argument also and said that mere position expressed with reference to the commentary do not alter the provisions of the treaty unless the treaty is amended by bilateral negotiations. Therefore, you may express a reservation, but that is of no use unless the treaty itself is amended. Therefore, all these reasonings and all these important points brought out led to the conclusion that these payments were not royalty. There was a sale of a product, there was a sale of goods, which was business income of those non-residents. And since they did not have a permanent establishment in India, that business income was not chargeable to action. You can imagine the wide applicability of this decision. And this decision is really quite a treat to read. It really throws great insights into a lot of other issues also. I've completed Supreme Court decisions. I was told I have time just until five o'clock. I had quite a few more decisions lined up, but I will just deal with one Bombay High Court decision, which I think can be of great use to a lot of people. 423 ITR 426, CESA Goa Limited versus JC. You know, we pay income tax, we pay surcharge, we pay education sales. In this decision, the issue arose whether education cess is an allowable deduction. The Bombay High Court says that Section 48.2, which lays down the disallowance, disallows any rate or tax levied on profits and gains of business or profession. Rate or tax. They say there is no reference to CES. Under the 1922 Act, the corresponding provision to Section 482 specifically referred to the word CES. When the Income Tax Bill of 1961 was promulgated, 482 did use the word CES rate or tax. But by the time that bill became an act on the recommendations of the select committee. The word cess did not find place in the final 48-2. 
Bombay High Court also relied upon a circular of the CBTT of 1967, which says that cess is not disallowable under Section 482. The department also tried to argue that the word tax includes cess. Even this argument was not accepted by the Bombay High Court. So the position now in Bombay High Court jurisdiction is, and there's even a Rajasthan High Court decision, which says that this education sets is an allowable deduction. This applies in possibly every single case. I would therefore suggest wherever you have appeals before CIT appeals or the tribunal, if you have not taken up this issue, please do take it up by way of an additional ground. We are taking it up as additional ground before the tribunal and the tribunal is admitting them and in fact deciding in favor of the SSC. Here you can rely upon the decision of <coughs> the Supreme Court in NTPC's case, 229 ITR, which says that additional grounds can be admitted provided they are pure questions of law and do not require any fresh investigation into facts. Surely we fit into this requirement and therefore additional ground should and is being admitted even by the tribunal. The last point I would make with reference to this decision is normally 43B would apply to this case and therefore you would be entitled to the deduction in the year of payment. Therefore my suggestion would be that your claim should be qua the amount paid by you during the relevant previous year and not the relevant education says pertaining to that assessment. What is actually paid during that year is what can be claimed as a deduction. I have several other decisions, but I am told I was to wind up at 5 o'clock. Thank you for a very patient hearing. Unless the uh, organizers give me a few more minutes, possibly I can take one or two more decisions. I leave it to you. So sure, you can take sir, uh, uh, you can take some more uh, uh, case laws if you want to. Another five minutes. How many minutes? How many minutes you can give him? Uh, sir, five, five uh, to seven minutes. It's okay. All right. If it so I will, interest, uh, I will take up two decisions of the Bombay High Court. These are of good relevance. 422 ITR 478 Bombay High Court, Atul Projects India Private Limited versus Union of India. This was a decision in the context of section 139.9, which refers to a defective return. The facts in this case were that the assessee filed an original return. The assessee received a notice under 139.9 from the AO saying that the return was defective and you please rectify it within X number of days. The assessee rectified the defects within those days. Thereafter, the SSC received a notice under 143.2 for a scrutiny assessment. It's important to note, as you know, 143.2 notice is to be issued within a certain time limit. The date of this 143.2 notice, if taken with reference to the date of filing the original return, it was time barred. But if it was taken with reference to the date on which the defects were rectified, the 143.2 notice was in time. The Bombay High Court accepted the argument that when you are making good the defects, the date of filing the return is the date of filing the original return and not the date on which you rectified the defects. What flowed from this was therefore that the 143.2 notice was held to be barred by time. This is a decision which can come to the aid of quite a few assessees. Particularly say if you have filed a loss return, as you all know, loss return is to be filed within the time under section 139.1. If your loss return was defective and if you got a defective notice which you rectified within the period permitted by that notice, this decision will help you to say that this loss return dates back to the filing of the original return and therefore your loss return would be taken as filed in time. 
same thing goes for chapter 6a deductions where also you are now required to file your return under section 139.1 possibly this decision would also apply to cases where you file revised returns i am aware of cases where we have argued that your original return was a return of profit income but you realized there was some error you did not claim certain expenses so you revised that, that return which resulted in a loss return and therefore the proposition being canvassed by the department was you are required to file a loss return in time as per section 80 and therefore we will not permit you to carry forward i think even in that situation this decision should come with the great help of the ssc uh one last decision which is greatly in favor of the ssc i'll just spend 2 minutes on this this is very important in the context of concealment penalty under 271c as you all know 271c has two limbs furnishing inaccurate particulars and concealment of income when you read assessment orders the assessing officers use wide ranging things in this context with reference to what they say in their assessment order some assessment orders say penalty proceedings under 271c are hereby initiated sometimes the limb is not clear they say the ssc has furnished inaccurate particulars leading to concealment of income what is this meaning because these are two different things some cases the assessing assessing officers are very clear and precise here 271c proceedings are initiated for furnishing inaccurate particulars there are different ways they project as to what they say in the assessment order but in most cases the show cause notices which accompany these assessment orders they do not specify the specific limb at least until some time ago most notices did not specify the limb there was no tick mark on the relevant limb whether it is furnishing inaccurate particulars or concealment of it the bombay high court in kaushalya's case had said that even if in your notice there is no specification of the limb if your assessment order is clearly specifying the limb then the requirement of law is satisfied bombay high court in goa dorado promoters case took a view contrary once there is no tick mark in the notice even if in the assessment order there is a clear specification the penalty is not valid so there was a conflict of opinion which led to this full bench being constituted this is a full bench decision and that is why it is more important it held in favor of the ssc it held that even if the assessing officer in the assessment order specifies the limb once there is a defect in the notice namely no tick mark at the relevant limb the entire proceeding stand vitiated and bad in law it says the assessment and penalty proceedings are not composite proceedings to draw strength from each another the penalty proceedings must stand up on their own notice should be precise and there is no room for any ambiguity penalty provisions must be construed very strictly and any ambiguity is to be used or ruled in favor of the ssc when the ao does not tick the relevant limb it betrays non application of mind on its part and for that you cannot expect the ssc to rise to the occasion and anticipate as to which of the limbs the ao is trying to apply you can imagine how widely applicable this decision is we have succeeded in so many matters before the tribunal and frankly lot of them are now escaping because of the you know, the um, tax uh, limits for filing appeals to the high court and based on these decisions lot of assessees can get away by virtue of this technical argument saying that the penalty proceedings are bad in law you not even required to go into the merits in very many cases so that tick mark which chartered accountants would appreciate is what makes the difference thank you very much 
thank you sir thank you indeed excellent uh, today again we have invented the importance of that tick mark <laughs> really wonderful uh, mishra ji are there any questions which has come up for this for sir we welcome our central council members c aniket aliket aniket ji talati bhai uh fine i think uh, 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 i'll request uh, arpit to kindly propose a formal vote of thanks to rightly deserved uh, hero sir uh thank you jayesh bhai and uh, hero sir believe me uh, the entire session that you've taken i mean right from the time that you start the citation i think it is really uh, very very exciting for us because you know we we are about to start on a new adventure a new uh, you know every case law is a new story and every experience so uh, so everything comes out in a beautiful manner so i think it was a perfect uh, session wherein you know we could all go with the flow of the way you have created these case laws in front of us i think uh, very very great learnings and uh, thank you for creating this amazing webinar for us today uh, i'm sure you know every aspect that you've dealt with has really made sure i mean you know we've been noting things down and as jayesh bhai mentioned that tick mark i think penalty is something that we are all uh, lot of uh, people are really harassed uh, you know and uh, some of these cases are already settled but still you know these systems are sending these notices again and again and again so i don't know where is going to end but uh, uh, really uh, you know when when people like you come and say that you know uh, everything is just a short fine uh, probably we get a sense of relief that okay fine we can really go ahead and we have these uh, good decisions to back up uh, and our you know our cases are all safe so thank you sir once again on behalf of wirc uh, we are really uh, happy that you have spared time and you have uh, shared your knowledge with us thank you for creating this amazing webinar over to you jayesh bhai thank you thank you hero sir thank you thank you arpit for a hearty vote of thanks uh, we have with us uh, our uh, next session brain trust uh, uh, session chairman uh, ca central council member ca aniket talati ji i would request him to kindly address the participants over to you aniket ji uh, thank you so much uh, jayesh bhai uh, let me also uh, thank uh, advocate hero rai ji thank you very much sir uh, i joined in at the later part of your session and i think uh, some very important judgments that have been shared by you i would like to thank uh, the team wirc led by manish gadia ji Jayesh ji, Arpit bhai uh, is here. My dear friend Sushant bhai is also here. All of whom I was in the initial council earlier, and uh, Dinesh Kanapar ji, who is the trustee for this uh, brain trust, welcome, very uh, welcome, sir, and a very good evening to you, along with uh, Rajan bhai and uh, P V Shrinivas ji. I am sure with these three uh, trustees, uh, it's going to be a phenomenal brain trust uh, where. i am sure you know the icing on the cake or the cherry on the top uh, as we would all like to have in the end of a session is going to be ensured by these three doyens of the profession who not only uh, in the tax matters but a lot of other aspects of our practice and profession are leading the way and leading the charge so uh, excellent and kudos to wrc for arranging this uh, series which is a tradition at wrc but specifically this year with the challenges of the pandemic Uh, great to see that you have used and leveraged technology once again to the benefit and advantage of the membership at large and we have participation in this wirc from across the country uh, from this dtrc from across the country so uh, compliments to you um, i would only like to add that manish bhai had requested me that uh, coincidentally in this dtrc the first day session was taken by my fa uh, father and past president of ici sunil talati ji on trust so i think uh, it's fate that i am now in the last session and uh, being here as a part of this uh, brain trust meeting i can only say that the structure of the dtrc has been very well designed especially keeping in mind uh, the contemporary times we live in i looked at the entire sessions specifically with inwit uh, the goodwill which has changed and i'm sure dinesh bhai can throw a lot of light on that Specifically, these changes that have been brought about, uh, you know, middle of the game, and how that impacts the entire M&A situation, the changes in the charitable trusts, and more importantly, the faceless, uh, faceless assessments and the appeals, how that is going to change our practice. Um, you know, having spoken about these changes, 
I can only, as chairman of Financial Reporting and Review Board, uh, maybe throw some uh, request to all the participants who are attending this seminar. I think we focus extremely well on taxation provisions. The amendments which come through, we are always up and geared to ensure that how that impact our client, what is going to be the changes in the tax outlay that will happen for the client per se is very well assessed by us. But I think some basic points regarding the accounting standards, regarding how we maintain the books of accounts is missed in the larger picture. And yes, we are very well compliant on the taxation aspect, but basics of accounting somewhere specifically some accounting standards. Just one example, let me share with you. Even today, one is seen in a lot of balance sheets, pre-operative expenses, and then they get amortized over five years. Now with the advent of AS26, that is intangible assets, the definition of intangibles is very clear. And these expenses, which we used to call as preliminary expenses, miscellaneous expenditures can no longer be, at least for the accounting standard perspective, amortized over five years. We may do a different treatment in taxation, absolutely fine with that. But we need to appreciate as a profession that taxation is not just the only aspect when you look at accounting. And specifically now, when MCA has amended the applicability of accounting standards, there is a huge simplification that has happened in terms of the standards which will apply to level one, two, three, and now the newly created level four entities. I would only hope that we have such wonderful participation in this seminar on taxation. And going forward, all of us as tax practitioners, I myself come from a tax heavy firm, also pay equal amount of attention to the accounting aspects because that will also have a huge bearing on how the finality of the tax proceedings also happen and more importantly as chartered accountants when we are attesting the tax audit report we are also attesting the financial statements and they have to be prepared in accordance with the accounting standards so with this i once again uh, compliment wrc for this wonderful initiative and thank you for inviting me uh, over to you Arpit. Thank you, Aniket ji. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind words. Uh, I would uh, uh, just uh, acknowledge my uh, thanks to Aniket ji for addressing the participants. And also I would like to, uh, uh, the entire program was structured by our direct tax committee chairman, Drushti Ben. She has done it wonderfully well, along with able support of uh, Arun Giri and uh, definitely Arpit and uh, Manish Bhai our chairman so uh, it's all credit goes to the entire uh, team of wirc entire council members uh, we have a brilliant uh, brain trust uh, coming i would request my colleague in council cs sushut chitle to kindly introduce uh, the panelists and uh, the moderator over to you sushut ji thank you jayesh uh, and thanks to aniket for setting the tone uh, frankly i think uh, None of the panelists as well as the moderators really require any introduction. Uh, but for the sake of, uh, I think, uh, the protocol, I'll just uh, quickly introduce maybe the panelists first and then our moderator for the day. Uh, so let me start with uh, Mr. Dinesh Kanabar. Mr. Dinesh Kanabar is the CEO of Dhruva Advisors. Uh, he has been the winner of the Asia Tax Practice Leader of the Year 2020. Prior to founding Dhruva, he held a series of leadership positions across several large professional service organizations in India, like KPMG, RSM, and PricewaterhouseCoopers. He is currently a member of the National Executive Committee of FIKI and a mentor of the FIKI Committee on Taxation. He was a member of the Rangachari Committee constituted by the Prime Minister to deal with tax reforms in the IT and ITA sector and for evolving safe harbor rules. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kanabar, for being here today with us. Thank you. Uh, Next is Mr. Rajan Vora. Uh, Mr. Rajan Vora heads the Ernst & Young's India's direct tax litigation practice. He has extensive experience in representing tax litigation matters before ITAT and authority for advanced rulings. Uh, he was earlier the president of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society in the year 1991. Uh, he is the chairman of the direct tax, com direct tax committee of IMC and a member of the taxation committee of the BCAS. He was co-opted as a member of the Committee on International Taxation of the ICAI. He has been named repeatedly as one of the top tax dispute advisors in India by Euromoney's International Tax Review magazine. 
uh, and he has authored several publications and has presented papers and has been a regular panel speaker at seminars and symposiums in India and abroad. Thank you again, sir, for being here with us today. Uh, next is Mr. P.V. Srinivasan. Uh, Mr. Srinivasan has worked for 18 years as head of corporate tax in Wipro Limited, Bangalore. Uh, for over 35 years, he has had hands-on experience in industry with regards to corporate tax compliance across a number of tax jurisdictions in India as well as abroad. He has participated as a member of the Emerging Issues Task Force on Non-Resident Taxation formed by the Ministry of Finance. He has been appointed as a NASCOM representative for resolving issues in Japan tax treaty. He has also participated as a member of the GST committee constituted by the Commercial Taxes Department of Karnataka. And he has also been a regular speaker at various fora as well as a contributor to various publications so thank you so much, Mr. Srinivas, for sparing your valuable time with us. Uh, and to put, I think, everything together, we have a wonderful moderator, Ameya Kunte. Ameya is an experienced tax professional, entrepreneur, and a chartered accountant. He runs his consulting firm, Global View Advisors, and specializes in tax-centric business advisory services, focusing on domestic tax and international tax. Ameya earlier co-founded Tax Sutra. Ameya has also worked with Ernst & Young and PwC in the past and has over 18 years of professional experience. He is a visiting faculty at ILS Law College Pune on the subject of taxation and is a regular speaker and contributor on technical topics. So thank you so much, everyone, and uh, over to you, Ameya. Thank you. Thank you, Sushrut. Uh, uh, good evening, Jayesh Bhai, uh, Arpit Bhai. Good evening, Drishti, as well. Uh, and uh, a welcome to all the brain trustees here, Dinesh Bhai, PBS sir, uh, Rajan Bhai, and uh, good evening to all the attendees uh, uh, from WIRC and from across the India. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, uh, stage set, uh, you know, towards the end of uh, uh, this uh, wonderful uh, DTRC series. Uh, we selected a session around brain trustees where we'll try and discuss some of the contemporary topics and uh, who better than the current three panelists uh, uh, to take us through, to guide us through uh, some of these uh, complex uh, tax business scenarios. Uh, we have about 15 issues uh, to be covered uh, over the next uh, one and a half, two hours, the time allocated to us. And, uh, uh, you know, each of the issues will be taken uh, by one of the brain trustees uh, uh, as well. That is how uh, sort of we will proceed uh, through this session. Uh, before we begin the actual scenarios, uh, uh, I think it is important to understand overall context uh, today, um, uh, you know, on, on the tax side. Uh, first thing, if you see last uh, maybe five to 10 years, there has been a trend of reduction in the corporate tax rates. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we have a very high incidence of the personal tax rate. I mean, as high as 43%. Uh, there are very interesting domestic tax policy choices being made by the government, uh, many times because of the ex external factors, but also we've, we've seen many loopholes being plugged, uh, amendments wherein court judgments uh, have sought to be uh, overruled. I think one general trend is that, uh, you know, anything which where there's a high income uh, incidence, uh, you know, tax it, be it provident fund contribution or uh, UDIPs. Uh, also, choice being given between old regime uh, where high tax rate accompanied by exemptions or a new regime, uh, you know, where there's a more straightforward uh, tax calculation. Uh, and as Aniket also mentioned, the regulatory environment is also complex, uh, you know, which impacts the tax policy choices as well. Uh, the third trend that we see is the use of the technology risk based assessment systems faceless assessments and appeals uh, being increasingly put to use. Uh, all of this is happening in India. At a global level, we have uh, work done by the multilateral frameworks such as OECD and UN and even G20, G7. Uh, and some of the decisions made over there also has an impact on the tax policy uh, in India. And last but not the least, the reality in India where we have uh, because of the social reasons as well as COVID, a high need for a expenditure and uh, the tax revenues, uh, uh, you know, still uh, 
you know are catching up so with this context i think uh, the today's case studies or today's questions uh, perhaps need to be seen uh, and like i said uh, we will try and discuss uh, 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 you, you know several issues uh, uh, over the course of uh, next two hours so uh, i am trying to just uh, share my screen for the first question um, uh, like i said uh, there will be each question uh, taken up uh, by one of the uh, brain trustees just allow me a moment uh, to to share my screen uh, anyone from the admin team of wrc can you so uh, while till the uh, you know the question is coming up on the screen the first topic uh, that we are uh, we are going to discuss today is uh, relating to the partnership taxation uh, and uh, uh, we have dinesh bhai sort of uh, uh, taking us uh, through that uh, we know this budget uh, has had uh, very interesting changes on the partnership law uh, and the current issue deals with the retirement and admission of a partner and uh, uh, movement of a real estate uh, associated with it dinesh bhai uh, over to you uh, thank you, Amen. Thank you uh, for having me here and good evening to uh, everybody. Uh, as uh, Amen rightly put as a background that uh, anything which has been resulting in a huge amount of controversy and probably what the legislature believes to be giving rise to income or exemption of income which is unintended is sought to be plugged. And one of the very, very important changes which we saw uh, in the Finance Act of uh, 2021 has been the entire change in the regime of taxation of partnership, particularly in the context of a reconstitution of the firm. As we are all aware, earlier we had Section 45.4. And Section 45.4 provided that if there was any income arising uh, as a result of dissolution or of the firm or otherwise, uh, then such income was liable to be treated as capital gains in the hands of the firm and no tax was required to be paid by the receiving partner. And a number of case uh, uh, the studies evolved uh, over a period of time. There was a question of what do you mean by dissolution of the firm or otherwise if the firm continued as it is, but there was a change in the share of partners, was that covered? Was that not covered? If you reevaluate the assets and credited the accounts of the partner and the partner took away what was their share, was it taxable, not taxable? And we had series of judgments which actually held on to say that if when a person retires or there's a change in the share, what a person gets is what is due to the person as a result of the credit to the capital account, then there are no gains arising at all. So the entire system has now been, or the entire mechanism has now been overhauled. We have seen two specific broad changes. One is a new section 45.4 being introduced and a new section 9 capital B being introduced. What section 45.4 provides is that where there is a reconstituted of a specified entity uh, and specified entity includes a firm and AOP, BOI, etc then and the word reconstitution has been defined to include whether it's a retirement change in the share whatever else so every every methodology by which a share of a partner could get impacted is thought to be covered then what is provided is that the capital gains will be computed in a manner specified as a formula which is uh, capital gains is a is a is equal to b plus c minus d b is the value of assets c is the value of cash and d is the amount standing to the credit of the capital account of a partner so in effect section 45.4 seeks to now provide that if you receive anything more than what is standing to the credit of your account then the difference is capital gain section 9b is amended to provide that where again there is a reconstitution of a specified entity including a firm and any asset is transferred then capital gains or a stock in trade whatever is the asset which is transferred to the extent that the value of the asset is in excess of its book value will be again deemed to be the income of the firm on which taxes will be payable 
And section 45 specifically clarifies that section 9b and 45 will operate coterminous with each other. So that's a broad background. The facts are very much here and I'm not repeating them. We have two assets, one which is stock in trade, one which is a capital asset. Both of them have appreciated in value. There are two partners in the partnership firm and why has now why private limited has now resigned from the firm uh, and pursuant to such resignation two assets have been transferred one is cash 21 another is uh, land which is uh, uh, held by the firm uh, as stock in trade and the question is what is the impact of the amended section 9b and section 45 4 how is the income liable to be taxed in respect of and uh, uh, if you look at section 9b the way it would operate in the given set of facts is that the, the what is sought to be paid over to a partner is stock in trade 20. Uh, that stock in trade uh, cost was only eight and therefore 20 minus eight will be deemed to be profits and gains of business arising and payable by the partnership firm. And then we go to section 45.4, which is in respect of capital gains. And here the capital gains will be calculated to say cash, which is of course 21. There is no capital asset which is being transferred and therefore that will be a zero. From that you will reduce the amount standing to the credit, uh, which is 10. And therefore you will have uh, 11 as the income arising uh, to the uh, partnership firm by way of capital gains. So in situation number one, you have two streams of income, which is arising to the partnership firm, 12, which is in the nature of profits and gains of business, and 11, which is in the nature of capital gain. And it will, it will be paying taxes on that. Of course, we all need to bear in mind that the taxes in this case are being borne by the firm, which was even earlier the case. And therefore, when a partner is going out commercially, one would want to ensure that the value of the other partners is not depleted because if they give 50% of the assets as, as is provided here and they also the firm also ends up paying capital gains then probably the cap the taxes to the account of the continuing partner but that's a commercial issue not a tax issue but just as a point to be made out there the question then goes on to say that what if the second asset which is being transferred was a capital asset and not a stock in trade would the consequences be different and very surprisingly, the consequences would be different. And that is probably what this case law seeks to address as an anomaly in the drafting. Because the way section 45.4 would then operate is to go back and say 21 is cash. 20 is the, the value of the assets so 41. 41 minus the balance in capital account, which is 10. So 31 would be the income which would be in the nature of capital gains in the hands of partnership firm. So in situation number one, where the asset is stock in trade, the income would be 12 plus 11 and 23. Of course, one is profits and gains of business, so there is capital gain, different rates of tax apply. But then when you go back to, uh, if the asset was held to be a capital asset and not a, not a stock in trade, then you would have 31. Uh, so the two different consequences which arise here, Primarily because in one case, you are reducing the balance in the capital account. In the other case, you are reducing what is the cost of the asset, which is not allowed to you as a deduction when you are computing the income under the head capital, capital gains. So two separate consequences. A very interesting question which came to my mind as we were debating this is that while this is the literal reading of the section, could one go back and say that when an asset is transferred so when an asset whose book value is 20 is book value is 8 is transferred for a value of 20 the difference should be credited to the capital account and the capital gains which are reduced which is computed when you do the formula of a is equal to b plus c minus d the d should not be the amount which is to the credit of the partner's capital account but the enhanced account, because now that capital account also contains the value increase in the value of asset. Nothing that the literal words of the section provide, but if that could be done, then probably the two approaches could be sort of reconciled. 
you must also note that uh, there is a specific provision in section 9b where government has been given a power to make rules no such rules have been made as yet to remove difficulties and i'm very sure that given this particular animal anomaly representations could be made to ensure that you do not end up paying a higher tax merely because something is a capital asset and not a stock in trade the final aspect of the question is that would the receiving company x private limited in this particular case be liable to tax under the normal provisions of the act and under mat clearly under the normal provisions of the act it would not be liable to tax because tax has been borne by the firm and what one is getting is a share of profit from the firm and therefore no tax would be payable but mat would indeed be payable in this particular case there is nothing uh, under section 115 which sort of exempts from the computation of the book profit uh, anything that is received by way of an asset and therefore the gain which is arising to y private limited which is of 31 41 being the value of assets and 10 being the balance in the capital account would be subject matter of mat in the hands of the company thank you that covers the case study thank you uh, thank you Dinesh bhai uh, you know we we grew up uh, studying tax where we learned uh, and you know uh, some of the past supreme court judgments or all the iconic commentaries Dinesh bhai mentioned that uh, you know interest of a partner in the firm is not a interest in any specific item of the partnership property uh, now more or less do we see the trend from a tax policy point of view to treat partner and the firm more or less uh, uh, as a separate entity uh, uh, you know uh, just just broad thoughts on a tax policy point of view this way uh, I, I, would, I would agree. I, I think uh, the way I would look at it, uh, even today, I don't think the law really uh, Ame is trying to make a distinction and say that they are distinct entities. You still have the concept that share of profit coming to a partner from the firm is taxed in the hands of the firm, not in the hands of the partner. I would say that for many, many years, indeed decades, we got away with probably an unintended uh, abuse of the of the act where we said that what is given to a partner is only a share but then obviously when the value has gone up nobody is paying tax neither the firm nor the partner so probably the way i would look at it is that maybe there was a loophole a lacuna in the law which went on for several decades and that had been exploited and that has just been set right because uh, indeed if there is a appreciation in the value of the assets and indeed such an asset has now indeed been transferred by the firm to a partner then somebody has to be paying tax on it. Of course, in this case, the firm pays not the receiving person, but that I think is more really plugging a loophole than to go back and say a change in philosophy of tax. Thank you, Dinesh Bhai. Thank you. Uh, the next issue, uh, you know, will be taken up by TVS, sir. Uh, very briefly, the issue concerns significant economic presence, but very, very consciously while choosing this particular issue, we've kept the requirements uh, and the needs of the many of the professional chartered accountants who need to issue form 15 CACB for various transactions. Uh, and it is in that context, the current changes will be examined uh, in the next question. O over to you, PVS, sir. Uh, so the significant economic uh, presence concept, uh, as we all know, has been inserted in the Income Tax Act, keeping in view the web's recommendations is a law in anticipation it has been put so that whenever there's a agreement amongst the committee of nations this section will be found in the domestic law and eventually it may be found in the treaties also that's the intent and it's going that way right now it's not there in the treaty but eventually some kind of a scp will be incorporated in the treaty now having kept in mind what scp has done is recast section 9 and then possibly the entire income tax in cross-border trade in slightly a broader perspective it deals with two levels of activities i have two levels of two limbs one limb dealing with transaction in goods services that is dealing with transactions the second one is activities like users and other things there are thresholds which have been prescribed so that there is no uh, small uh, what's called safe harbor rules have been built into the provisions the, uh, the case study we have, we don't have to deal with the case safe harbor because it's far above the safe, safe harbor. We don't have to deal with it. The question is, uh, in a classic case, 
uh, in an export transaction is it is on a principle to principle basis uh, under the old law there would not be any accrual of income because it's on principle to principle and therefore uh, the and the goods are exported from the country of the non resident it is received here it would not amount to any accrual of income in india and the consideration also would be paid outside india the receipt criteria also would not be met so it will not meet the accrual criteria it will not meet the receipt criteria it wouldn't have been taxable uh, and uh, as we all know the ihs decision of the honorable supreme court also said that mere existence of a, a business connection would not mean that there's an attribution of income which is required and an attribution would require some amount of activity to be carried on in india by the p those principles possibly have been uh, recast by the explanation 2a which has been inserted what it does is that any transaction by a non resident within india would result in some kind of a, uh, a significant economic presence which is a business connection as it has been defined uh, we have to differentiate the two provisions explanation 2a the proviso under that and explanation uh, 3 which is dealing with the explanation 2 when you see explanation 3 it refers to operations carried out in india means an agency p will be liable to tax only if there are operations carried out by the agency p in india and the attribution will be restricted to the operations carried out in india that expression is missing in 2a it only says income attributable to the business connection that means there is no operation required in india mere business connection some income will be attributable possibly this is set on the basis that we are shifting towards some element of taxation in market and not necessarily in the production state alone and therefore these transactions have been brought within the scope so the difference in the proviso of explanation 2a and explanation 3 brings out that mere sale of goods by a non resident to india would generate some amount of income in india and it will be liable to tax Uh, we do not know what formulatory approach will eventually occur on these kind of things but there is some element of income if there is an element of income the question is whether it would require now we have to understand the uh, transaction in non dta situation if there is an element of income and it is liable to tax obviously uh, the uh, forms will be required we have brought out that rule uh, uh, 37 bb cause out an ex exception for import of goods but that exception exception is carved out when income is not chargeable to tax this exception may not apply if the income is chargeable to tax so in a way that the rule sub 3 uh, the rule sub rule sub rule 3 which you have pointed out uh, may find it to be otios on redundant because this is a case where the income is chargeable to tax by the act so the form will not apply in a non dta situation in a dta situation there are two possibilities uh, one possibility is that the pe is not amended on the lines of the business connection the pe is in narrower in scope than what is there in the business connection then the person is entitled to a relief automatically the it means that the, uh, the uh, non resident would like to avail the dt relief and once he wants to avail the dt relief form 15 cb will be required and he has to furnish form 15 cb to essentially say that he is relying on the p definition under the tt and therefore business connection has got no relevance it's, uh, it's uh, uh, it has to be ignored and the tt provisions would hold right and he would get the benefit of this so 15 cb will be required to say that mere definition of p is different from bc that itself would be a question of form furnishing a form assuming that both are similar in the sense business connection reads along like p and the amended treaty looks exactly identical to what is there in the business connection then it is as much as much as a domestic situation then you need still a kind of a form to be issued by the ca so you you find very peculiar circumstances that even for a mere import of goods there will be some amount of forms to be issued the documentation will have to be clarified it has possibly created a new situation the trade actually may be somewhat kind of disturbed by this kind of a formulation i would expect possibly if there's an uh, formulatory apportionment principle which is brought out and some kind of a income can be determined and the withholding can be effected the form will be dispensed with 
uh, and there is also an agency principle under 163 which also deals with the business connection and maybe some kind of an agency principle will also be put into place so that you can get over the forms uh, in every transaction that which it applies uh, possibly this answers uh, the per perfect answer can come well, uh, uh, in the limited uh, we are dealing with the current law with the situation then these are the outcome but i am very sure some remedy remedial action will have to come because state cannot be issuing forms for every transaction of import and export finally these are forms for remittance of money they are not forms for, uh, forms for determination of income thank you uh, pvs sir uh, the last i mean just staying on this thought uh, uh, you know the kanga palki wala 11th edition which was updated by mr data last year uh, you know does make a mention about uh, significant economic presence and you know explanation to a and how broadly the explanation has been worded and uh, you know uh, in in the commentary uh, it is written that uh, uh, you know this seems to be a case of a faulty drafting uh, possibly uh, you know very quickly any thoughts on 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 this aspect that the scope extends beyond the digital transaction and sort of impacts the normal trade transactions as well yeah i have seen uh, mr data's uh, um, uh, commentary i would accept a faulty drafting once whether faulty drafting will be repeated every time you recast it i do not know so i think it is a intended uh, drafting all that i will say the trade pressures have not been felt by the government so far the trade pressure will come at some point in time and that time the drafting will improve today's is a posturing i may say these provisions are posturing to the international committee that unless you have got a good formulatory approach we can have a different approach that kind of a mechanism this posturing is good i think we all have to serve our country's interest through the best mechanism that's available to us but eventually it will all boil down to some kind of a understanding that there should be some activity whatever is the principle in explanation 3 that will have to be brought down into explanation 2 otherwise just mere transaction with the indian community uh, by non resident in india and a, trade, a transaction of sale of goods uh, i think will be uh, uh, costing a huge burden on the cross border trade and particularly so i don't think a country like india would like to jeopardize its trade interests in the interest of collecting some tax thank you thank you pv sir uh... Uh, uh rajan bhai uh, you you been practicing for last uh, almost 40 years i don't know how many times you had a occasion to see an order or a issue relating to reassessment i think it is by far one of the most uh, uh litigated sections uh, uh, in the income tax law and again uh, we saw substantial changes in the current budget uh, uh, that is 2021 uh, the next issue uh, deals with uh, some of the very interesting facets relating to reassessment rajan bhai over to you thank you amaya thank you wrc for giving me the opportunity uh, i am happy to be associated with dtrc this year also very well organized dtrc i echo the what was said by ankit and uh, shushrut uh, i had occasion to uh, be on this platform with their father i am happy to be here with uh, now their children So I only feel whether we have become outdated or we should be uh, 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 give opportunity to more youngsters to come on this platform. Anyway, be that to be. Uh, coming to the issue, I think you rightly said and rightly put the tone about the reassessments. I think hundreds of cases uh, I must handle. I am not sure how many everybody put together must handle about the reassessment cases. And one of the used to be a common challenge is: is there a reason to believe? and uh, uh, this question is a little longer question with five sub sub sections a uh, sub uh, sub uh, questions so therefore i will take little time but we will match up uh, uh, try to catch up with the later two questions which are uh, uh, given to me where we will take a lesser time but this is very important for us to understand the background in which this amendment has been brought in uh, uh, the uh, as dinesh rightly mentioned purpose of this 21 amendment is to do away with lot of uh, decisions which uh, uh, the legislature failed or government failed that was creating a hindrance to the implementation of the law and therefore that need to be overruled some of the decisions and this is one of such provision which is tried to supersede so many of decisions of the courts about what is meant to be reassessment and what is valid reassessment i think that was the important point to be kept in mind while considering this amendment 
Now, all along, we have been grown uh, with, uh, as you rightly said, grown with seeing what is meant by reason to believe under section 140, 147A and 147B. We started from there, then it was only 147. And every time, uh, 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 courts struck down the provision because invariably, 147 never used to be applied with proper application of mind. And there used to be several reasons for this getting struck down because there was no proper recording of reasons. And the recording of reasons had, was not matching with ultimately the assessment or reassessment has been done. So therefore, that was the, one of the reasons. The necessary approvals and time limits which were prescribed also were not strictly followed by the tax officers, which also gave a reason to struck down the provisions or struck down the reassessment provisions. And we have several decisions of the courts, which has categorically said, ki, even non-application of mind by commissioners while approving or higher authorities in approving the reassessment itself a mechanical approval is not sufficient for them they must apply their mind properly so therefore this was the background in which this amendment has been brought so now this is to be very very interesting to see this provision has become already effective from 1421 so all the reassessments which are sought to be done will be governed by the new amendments so again uh, there was some doubt whether it will apply to the new assessment years or it will apply to all the notices which are issued for reassessment 1421 onwards. My personal belief is it is applicable for all uh, reassessments done after 1421, irrespective of the year for which it is covered. Now, question is time limit, which will come to a little later about time limit, but let's stick to the first point or first questions which are raised before us. Now, what are the things which are sought to be covered in this? Now, as rightly been highlighted, there are two. Uh, the uh, question is whether this section is expansive, expansive measure or restrictive measures. Whether by amending the law, uh, amending the section, has the legislation restricted the powers of the officers for a reopening? And reason to believe is not open enough for them to consider what is reopening and what should be applied to. And are they to supposed to be within the boundary which has been flagged around? by the uh, uh, the law as to within that they have to consider in light of this, this is important to understand what is it sought to be covered i think we need to understand the section very very carefully because it, the what is said to be there uh, effect is reassessment notice can be issued by ao in his possession is in possession of an information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment I think this is the uh, important words which we need to keep in mind. Now, what is meant by information in possession of officer means it has it says means it has a two aspect, two limbs of the uh, definition, which says any information flagged in the case of assessy. Important words are in the case of assessy for the relevant assessment year in accordance with the risk management strategy formulated by board from time to time. That is a one requirement which has been cast upon the officer second requirement which he need to satisfy is any final objection raised by cag to the effect that assessment in the case of assessc for the relevant year has not been made has not been made in accordance with the provisions of this act now these are the two important criteria which have been laid down now if we try to really analyze these words and try to see now first condition is the risk management strategy formulated by board in the case of whether applicable to the case of assessing flagged in the case of assessing now do we have access to such a strategy i my information from my uh, 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 discussion with the some of the officers in the department say this strategy is a confidential document we are not supposed to know what this strategy is so now how do i know what is the strategy which has been used by them for the purpose of invoking against me and whether that is properly applied for. Now, do I have to go to the writ petition, writ, writ court to find out whether this is correctly applied or not applied? Whether I have to go under RTI to find out whether this, what was the strategy which is correct or not correct? Now, how do I find out? Now, why this becomes important? Because information flagged in the case of SSC. Now, this has to be read along with the strategy, adopt, a strategy formulated by board. Now, how do I find out whether the stat, what is my information flag is associated or connected with the formulated by the board so because that becomes a so crucial for me so now let's take a situation as to there is a transaction which has been flagged uh, there is a transaction which i have entered into 
but the risk management strategy could be something else now the in the courses of either regular assessment or in the case of faceless assessment how do i find out what is has been done so therefore that becomes a crucial for us to understand and which i'll come to a little later about section 148a which is simultaneously amended now and which has been brought on the statute which also has become important so therefore that is the point which we need to consider and see now this is the point which we need to consider the second point which we need to consider second point which we need to consider is object final objection raised by cag now and again what is it there is in the case of assc for the relevant year has not been made in accordance with the provisions of this act now how do we know what is accordance with the law accordance with the act it could be ocean because everything possible which is not found to be proper by cag could be not in accordance with the law so every objection raised final objection raised by cag will it be uh, expanding the real scope uh, for the for the purpose of every reassessment which is sought to be done by the assessing officer so again going back to my question earlier question is this amendment has expanded the scope of uh, reassessment that is one aspect or is it reduced or restricted the scope of assessing officer for reassessment according to me uh, the way things are functioning according to me scope has virtually got expanded according to me, scope has virtually got because you don't have access to what is the risk management strategy by the government so you have no access to understand what is happening there now what is the cag objection whether you will be available to will you be given that objection will you be uh, uh, able to reply to that objection what is happening again not known to us how is going to function again not known to me now interesting part of this is it has to be read along with 148a because uh, to that extent what finance minister said ki we have done many changes we have put lot of restrictions on the officer because of we have brought in section 148a now what 148 says is two tier show cause notices to be issued if assessing officer finds of information he supposed to send a notice to the assessing officer uh, the assc ask his response and with that response he has to make up his mind whether that is response is proper or not proper and then he can again uh, take a appropriate approval and then issue the final uh, re uh, reopening notice so there are two tier and it is also said that he is supposed to take approval of appropriate authorities now that also is again we have seen our past experiences generally the approvals are mechanical approvals and with the faceless you will never have uh, uh, the uh, uh, clarity as to how this whole process of Uh, 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 approvals have been worked upon so therefore this is another aspect though uh, statute has provided some inbuilt mechanism i am not sure in practice how it's going to work and this gets further confirmed with the some of the experiences which some of our colleagues or professionals have shared about the faceless assessment which has happened in the last 6 uh, or 8 months time so therefore my anxiety and my worry is uh, this provision is not going to reduce any litigation this will only increase the litigation so what we were happy with the, what is meant to be by reason to believe and which law was getting more and more settled now we have unsettled that whole thing and now the fresh set of litigation will start with understanding this amended provision and whether how to be interpreted that provision so that's a preliminary remark about uh, this provision whether how it will work the second important aspect is and as what is the coming back to our first query is uh information is flagged in the case of a limited indicated that particular transaction even in b limited had earned certain income which might have escaped assessment now this was exactly the point i was trying to make out now how do we find out risk assessment strategy or risk uh, for a uh, 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 risk management strategy now this is the information found in the case of a now that information you want to use it in case of a b if you see the section section says uh, information flagged in the case of assc now can that information flagged in the case of a can it be used in the case of a un unless unless there is a interlinked transaction now take a case of interlinked what is interlinked transaction suppose somebody has sold a property to uh, a has sold property to b a has been found to be with undisclosed income or for whatever reason that is held to be taxable in his hand can that be treated as a interlinked transaction automatically can the notice be issued to be under 147 and the amended law that's the point but we are only saying there is a, suppose a series of transactions entered into by seller to several purchasers one of the case is found to be a, a bogus uh, purchaser uh, uh, by one party can that be information be used in case of all other purchasers say 
based on the information which is collected in the case of or information which is flagged in the case of a can be used for bcde so that's the question which we come if you ask my opinion it is a good case to argue that if information is flagged in the case of a it cannot be made use of in b unless there is a interlinking of transaction and that has been flagged in the case of risk management strategy this is the answer to first query now the second query is does the initiating of reassessment proceedings on the basis of determination of cag amount to overriding wisdom of income tax authority indicating cit under 263 or would it still have position to decide independently on the basis of representation by the SEC? now this as i was saying we need to go back to the history and what was the decision on case of internal audit objections which were raised and how would the courts have dealt with such of the some, some of these uh, internal audit objections and the historical decision is of indian and eastern newspaper society as old as 1990 ITR, and which had said internal audit objection cannot be a source for the purpose of reassessment or that cannot be source of inform even though that can be source of information but that cannot be the sole reason for reassessment and that has been host of decisions starting from 119 itr right up to 400 itr we have several decisions to that effect now the question comes up is after the uh, internal audit versus cag audit we need to find some dis distinction now earlier it was not part of the act is the audit objection becomes automatically for the purpose of reassessment but now has it been brought in the act and saying that it is a final cag objection will that become a mandatory for the officer to proceed and therefore he has no scope either under 263 or under the uh, reassessment to uh, do anything and has to go by strictly by the provisions what is actually been objection raised now take a case of another important issue which is important to be considered what does that mean by CAG objection? Suppose CAG objection says you are in the uh, Healy area and entitled for a deduction under section, say, ATIC uh, or ATI, uh, uh, that section. He says, no, according to him, it is not eligible for deduction. And you find such CAG objections several cases. Now, if it is general object observation made, can that become a binding officer without being verification by the facts and without verification of such audit objection? In my personal opinion, even though objection is raised by CAG, still commissioner will have to establish, officer will have to establish that based on his objection, there is some escapement of income which leads to reassessment of So therefore, that has to be read in the context in which it is given. So merely because section C, subclause B says so, it does not become automatic and mandatory. But in practice, it will become a mandatory. Today also, even internal order objections used to become a virtually mandatory for the officers to 263 or 147 so therefore this will be far more now strengthen their hands to reopen the assessment so therefore practice will be only further litigation will increase on this point that is number two now interesting aspect is part c and which is uh, th uh, second limp of this reassessment extension of time and uh, we, we we those who had heard the prime minister uh, finance minister mentioning that we have now made the reassessment provisions much more stricter and now we have brought down from 16 years to three years uh, only and assessments cannot be reopened but probably she did not highlight or it was a fine print she wanted for our surprise is to really what is the clause 149 uh, 1 a and 149 1b which is not really really highlighted at that point of time now these provisions is very interesting for us to understand what is the provision says now, if we see, uh, uh, is what is it? Uh, the time limit has been there. Uh, the time limit is normally brought down from ten years to uh, three years. However, if AO on the basis of material available in the record, including assess his reply, whether or not, uh, uh, whether or uh, whether there is a income chargeable to tax representing in the form of assets which has escaped assessment amounting to 50 lakhs or more the period gets extended to 10 years time so therefore this becomes a crucial for us to find out whenever such reopening has happened the condition which is prescribed is only for the purpose of extending time for three years to 10 years this condition is not applicable for the purpose of reassessment provision conditions what we saw that is a and b what we discussed earlier this is only for the purpose limited purpose of extension of period from three years to ten years and this three year to ten years 
is very important again what i said is because he has to satisfy that uh, based on representation in the form of as it has to be represented in the form of asset which has escaped assessment now the example what i gave suppose officer comes to the conclusion that income uh, you have claimed exemption under atic incorrectly now in that in case can he reopen the cases for 10 years what he have he has to establish what is being represented uh, in the form of asset now claiming of exemption how is it becoming uh, uh, represented by asset so now therefore this is going to be a crucial for the purpose of decision another interesting point hopefully uh, legislators are not listening to this talk or they will not pass on to them but if you see the definition of asset what is given is asset definition says immobile property share security loans advances and deposits in the bank it doesn't cover jewelry it doesn't cover furnishing it doesn't cover your painting or any other valuable asset which are not listed here so what does that mean does it mean if there are any other assets represented in undisclosed income you can't reopen the assessment period will not get extended to 10 years is that the interpretation uh, i am not sure is that this correct interpretation but the law as it stands today that is the interpretation which is revealed and therefore we have to be careful in uh, just considering whenever we are such notices or reopening is coming the third point incidentally which must you must consider the courts recently as uh, recently as in the month of june uh, bombay high court has struck down the notice of reassessment because 148a procedure was not properly followed so therefore this becomes a crucial because court has said ki 148a is a precondition for 148 so therefore we must ensure that all those conditions which are prescribed therein are followed time limits are followed so that's a point we consider now uh, last point is the illegal ownership of asset account to me uh, the question is very important because what it sought to be considered is only legal ownership asset if it is to be represented by asset it has to be legal ownership so if there is not a legal ownership he can proceed against the who, whose name asset is standing and he can treat him as a benamidar and do whatever he want but as far as this is concerned it has to be legal ownership so these are the i think points sorry for taking little longer time but this was the important point for all of us to be on the same page even for me it took considerable amount of time to understand what this provision and how to interpret this provision so therefore at least this cave question gave me some uh, insights to study this provision and share my thought uh, with that back to uh, ame thank you thank you rajan bhai uh, interesting facets and uh, we have almost a reboot of uh, 147 law uh, you know with this budget changes uh, uh, moving on uh, another significant change introduced uh, this year is uh, you know and which impacts several transactions uh, is relating to the goodwill and uh, we have a very very interesting uh, uh, situation and i request uh, dinesh bhai to uh, take us through that uh thank you amit so uh, we are now uh, in fact aniket earlier on mentioned that uh, one of the very important changes and what he said is changing the rules of the game midway uh, was this amendment to non allowability of depreciation on goodwill and the question is a very interesting one so Uh, if we look at first of all what are the amendments to understand the question and therefore what are the repercussions a uh, section 32 has been amended now to provide that the intangible assets which were eligible to depreciation from 1998 onwards would not include depreciation uh, to an extent this amendment is retrospective because it applies from assessment year 21 22 so in fact for the year uh, accounting year march 21 also depreciation is not available uh, the question which has been asked is that if an ssc has got depreciation allowable and we are not getting into other controversies as to how was such goodwill created and um, uh, whether it was an amalgamation so we are keeping all of those out but if an ssc has a loss in the earlier years depreciation was claimed but that depreciation could not be allowed because of losses and there is accumulated depreciation would such depreciation be eligible to uh, to uh, become part of current year's depreciation and therefore would it totally lapse so would the accumulated depreciation up to an inclusive of assessment year 2021 become part of depreciation for the assessment year 2122 and since from the assessment year 21 22 depreciation is not available would such depreciation go for a toss so first of course we all recognize that smith securities 
and all the subsequent judgments which have come have now all been overturned the question is why is it that the law has provided in the context of section 322 that depreciation to which full effect cannot be given in a year will be treated as an allowance of the succeeding year and be treated as part of depreciation the real reason why section 322 has been brought into the statute is two one is that if past depreciation to the extent that it is not absorbed is treated as part of current year's depreciation then it can be set off against any other income number one and number two it is eligible for an indefinite carry forward the eight year restriction does not apply and the question is whether these two benefits which otherwise come into play actually work negative in the context of unabsorbed depreciation on goodwill and in my view it should not be so i do not think that the unabsorbed depreciation uh, would be would for the past years would sort of merge with the current depreciation and not be available to my mind such depreciation would be allowed to be carried forward and available and set off against income of the succeeding years and the reason i say this is manifold first is that there is a requirement to make adjustment of wdv under section 43 so under 43 to the extent that depreciation has not been availed of on goodwill it will become sort of part of the block on which depreciation will not be allowed in the future and that speaks of depreciation allowed or allowable so any depreciation whether it is actually allowed or was allowable remove that and only the balance the residual wdv will be added back to the block now it cannot be that i do that and correspondingly i am not even allowed the depreciation so that that sort of shows uh, the the intention of the legislature also if we go back and say that this amendment is effective from assessment year 21 22 and if we were to consider unabsorbed depreciation as therefore not exigible or lapsing so to say then we are actually giving retrospective nature to this amendment which was never intended and finally there was there is indeed one set of situation where the law envisages such a change so if you look at the provisions of uh, section 115 bab and bba both under the new tax regime uh, there is actually a provision that to the extent past depreciation is unabsorbed it will no longer be eligible for the new regime so wherever the legislature did want such an amendment to happen it has been so provided it is not provided in this particular case and therefore to my mind uh, depreciation which is unabsorbed will be available in the future will not become part of depreciation for the assessment year 21 22 and therefore will not be sort of lapsing so to say for the purpose of future years that's number one the second question which has been asked is that x limited has now obtained a valuation report and as per that valuation report there are components of this depreciation of this goodwill which comprise of other identifiable asset whether it is a customer list or whatever else and as per the example six crore is customer list and four crores is residual goodwill is it now possible for the taxpayer to go and say that yes what ought to be hit by the amendment in future is only this residual goodwill and not this six crore which comprise of other intangible asset which as per section 32.1 continues to be eligible for depreciation and to my mind it indeed should be possible it is possible for an SSE, of course one has to obtain a valuation report one has to do an exercise it might be uh, important for example even in the accounts to really reclassify asset but it would not be out of place for an SSE subject to adducing necessary evidence as to how such a valuation has come up to go back and say that what when i put a sum of rupees 10 crore by way of depreciation since there was a common rate of tax or common rate of depreciation uh, 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 and uh, i did not need to specify really and identify various components thereof i did not bother to make that distinction but now i have got a valuation and that valuation indeed shows that not all of it is so to say goodwill uh, it is something else then i can do so and that is also again supported 
by the fact that again as we said for section 43 wdv ascertainment one has to really take into account depreciation on goodwill and what is that goodwill therefore needs to be ascertained and it would not be out of place to do that two comments i would make one uh, uh, as i mentioned one has to do a proper valuation exercise second do i need to reflect it appropriately in my books of accounts a question would arise as to whether such an asset take for example a customer list or whatever else has to qualify as an asset under accounting standard 26 aniketa can refer, uh, refer to that and to my mind the fact that an asset is or is not an depreciable asset for the purpose of accounting standard ought not to impact my ability to get depreciation under the income tax act i really should be able to say that if it is indeed an intangible within the meaning of section 36 1 then it is eligible for depreciation and i should be uh, entitled to depreciation uh, indeed of course uh, the fact that a tax officer will most likely not accept it and this may go for litigation probably is, is a given thing but the fact that legally such a claim is tenable is absolutely uh, no, no question about it the last question is uh, indeed very very interesting uh, the pr proposition is that there is an opening block of goodwill which is of two crores and when you compute the amount which is now required to be excluded from wdv it is three crores in our given facts we are told that the block of intangible is not merely this goodwill but there are many many other assets and therefore obviously in an earlier year some of the intangibles were sold at a price higher than the cost of the wdv and therefore there is a gain which was not recognized because it was in the nature of a block now i have a wdv of two crores from which i have to reduce three crores and the question is is this one crore now exigible to tax in the current year and to my mind the answer has to be no because when you are making this adjustment this is an adjustment first of all in an earlier year when you realize it again in this year the asset is not ceasing to exist because assets are continuing to be in the block maybe such assets are now no longer exigible to depreciation but the block continues to be there section 50 subsection 2 therefore ought not to come into play whatever was received in the earlier years would continue to be so to say a capital receipt because remember it is not a receipt for this year at all it is only arising by virtue of an adjustment and that adjustment would not be exigible to tax in the current year so back to you Amai. thank you thank you by uh, very very interesting uh, comments uh, uh, and again uh, uh, goodwill law will unfold uh, in the coming years uh, thank you for those comments sir uh, moving on uh, uh, you know a couple of years back to attract the investments uh, finance minister and the current government announced a new corporate tax regime uh, you know 15 percent tax on manufacturing profits and uh, obviously covid has derailed uh, several expansion plans for the businesses as well so uh, in light of that the next situation uh, i request uh, pvs sir uh, to to discuss the impact of uh, and interpretation of 115 bab that is a 15 percent manufacturing tax rate pvs sir uh, this case study, uh, the company has been formed as per the threshold uh, timeline which has been given, that is after October uh, 2019. So that is not an issue. The unit which commences manufacture also has commenced manufacture uh, before 23. That condition is also met. Yeah, so it is a new manufacturing, is a new company manufacturing a new product. There is no reconstruction. All assets are new all conditions are met so the unit a manufacturer or division a manufactures the product and it continues to manufacture so the conditions are all met it would qualify for a 15 percent rate of taxation that's not the issue the issue is that the company commences uh, division b uh, which is uh, more like a forward integration that is it a, a new article will emerge the article produced by division a which was the first unit which commenced manufacture within the timeline. Uh, Division B commences after the timeline, that is beyond the date of uh, March 31st, March 2023. That means it's going to commence, to say, in December 2023. So the new uh, Division B will commence later. It is going to manufacture a product which is a forward integration. That is the unit A product 
will go into unit B or the division A product will go into division B. There are no restrictions. Number of divisions can be many. Section 115 BAB does not put a restriction on number of undertakings. You can have any number of undertakings. That's not an issue. The question is whether it is an article or thing which has commenced to manufacture before 31st March 2023. I would possibly uh, look at, uh, there are two levels at which the articles or things are referred uh, in the conditions part. Uh, the clause A at some point refers to an article or thing, and and it, well, that means it is referred to an article. So it is a, at that point is not determinative as to which article or thing it wants to refer to anything. It can be any article or thing which qualifies. There are no restrictions to this article or thing, and it can be any article or thing which can be manufactured. Then you go to clause B, and the clause B, there is a condition which has been put, which says that which are, which are the activities which are in relation to. The question is, the, how do you read the word in relation to? If I have to read the provision just for uh, clarity of thought, not that everybody will have access to the provision, the company is not engaged in any business other than the business of manufacture or production of any. Here the word any is used. The any here possibly is reference that you can manufacture some other article or thing. Uh, it need not, the first an article is an identified article. Now you can manufacture any other article or thing which is uh, and research in relation to such article or thing. Okay. Now, such article or thing, the, whether the such uh, in relation to qualifies what? It qualifies the manufacturing activity or it qualifies the research activity. Uh, uh, that's the key question which has been possibly left in the question. Uh, possible, uh, it, it leads to two or three kinds of interpretation. There is also a two level, two explanations have been added in the very same section. There's an explanation under clause B, immediately under clause B. Uh, which says that what are the activities shall not include. There are certain exclusions which are carried out under the explanation B. And there is another explanation which has been added, uh, but under a little later under clause C, but nevertheless it refers to the same clause B. Uh, it says that it shall uh, include electricity manufacture. So there's an inclusion, there's an exclusion. Now, uh, electricity can one can understand that suddenly if I have a unit which is manufacturing, I can set up a captive electricity plant. That will be backward integration, more or less, in the sense I start generating my own electricity, and therefore it could include electricity manufacture can be one way of looking at it. Shall not include. What can be carved out possibly in the, in the classic under, understanding is that you can carve out only one thing, those which are included in the main provision. Now, the kind of explanation which has added, the carve out doesn't seem to be limiting, in the sense, why would I, uh, car would be bottling gas into cylinder. So should the, uh, it, does it restrict itself to a gas manufacturing unit or it can be applied to your computer manufacturing that gas. So the question is whether it narrows down to a yeah, specific business or the article or thing. So the key question is whether the in relation to qualifies the research in relation to or it qualifies the article or thing, which is the pay affair. Any backward integration is not a problem. Any expansion is not a problem. You can have any number of undertakings manufacturing the same product in multiple locations, no problem. All these things are permitted. The only question is whether power integration is also allowed. The way the question is for the provisions are formulated, I would be a little guarded for the consequences of the provisions. It's the way because it's not mere consequence. You don't land up with the, okay, you lose it. You don't land up with an ordinary rate of tax you will end up with a much higher consequence than what you would land up in a normal rate of tax. So I would possibly think at this point in time that the in relation to qualifies both the manufacturer article or thing, and then it uses such article or thing. Now that such article or thing again refers to the one which started in subclass A, or it refers to one which is subclass B. These are very, very difficult uh, interpretations which will be left to and it will be quite high splitting on the way. It is great. Also, there's a comma everywhere in there. Never in my life have I left comma so uh, difficultly placed. This section certainly places the comma very difficultly. So I would think uh, if you are, I will go into the bis uh, business appetite or risk appetite of the entrepreneur. The explanation, which is a carve out, shall not include, possibly uh, brings out a great amount of comfort. 
that it is actually any article or thing. That's the way it looks, that it's any article or thing. Uh, but uh, if you are a very guarded, uh, risk, uh, you know, risk averse to litigation and you want to settle it one or once for all, I would possibly say, don't take a chance. The inhalation can be written to the articular thing which started in the class A. Then it has to be very narrow scope. But again, class A can be announcement. For example, I could have started with a computer of a old model. Suddenly the computer models have changed. So what now looks now is maybe different from the computer I started earlier. That is acceptable because it all falls into the same classification of uh, uh, goods. Possibly they have picked up this law from the excise law. In the excise law, we have a lot of higher splitting as to classification and other things. This has also come possibly in there. So I would think it goes into, I would, my own advice, my own thinking is it has not restricted as much, but it goes into a lot of risk appetite because you are not going to have ordinary consequences. You are going to have extraordinary consequences because of misreading of this provision. Thank you. Thank you, PVS, sir. Uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, perspective uh, over here as well. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, I request Rajan Bhai to take up uh, the next situation, uh, which is uh, uh, dealing with the joint ownership of the assets uh, uh, and uh, you know, whether it is a co-ownership or the association of persons uh, related issue. Rajan Bhai. Thank you, Ame. I think very interesting. PVS uh, had raised the interesting issue. I think that gives uh, uh, this is question is comparatively easier question, so I think we can finish it faster so that saving some time for the uh, dealing with the non-resident question, residency question, which will take a little more time. So here's the question, I think interesting question, and which is a very common question in all industrial groups. I think we, we have seen many of the industrial groups own nowadays uh, private aircrafts and private aircrafts, helicopters which are being used. And uh, in the COVID situation, we have seen many of the people flying out of the with the private aircrafts going from one place to another place uh, also is very very regularly used so that became an uh, interesting aspect but the point is looking to the value of the helicopter or aircraft the value is quite substantial many times it happens if it is not very large group for one company to absorb the depreciation or the expenses so therefore it is uh, purchased by two or three uh, entities in the group together now question is if that uh, entities uh, use that uh, uh, aircraft for themselves, aircraft or helicopter for themselves and not for the commercial use. Will it be treated as an AOP or it will be treated as a co owner of asset and each one can claim a depreciation? I think this is the, exactly the issue which is uh, very interesting to cover. Now we need to consider two or three aspects. Uh, we need to go back to the history and see the amendment in the section 32, which was made uh, uh, quite some time back. Because this was exactly issue because earlier department used to say if the asset is co-owned by more than one person, then asset is not owned by you and therefore not eligible for depreciation. So therefore that it is to get over that litigation or to get over the controversy uh, act was amended to include uh, as asset owned wholly or partly. So therefore that amendment has been done on the basis of which there are several companies claiming depreciation on joint assets or co-owned assets on which has been regularly allowed. Now, therefore, to that extent, there was no difficulty as such. But the question is very interesting. Will buying of asset and using it for themselves by both these companies will be treated as an association of person? And will there be a separate assessment for this uh, aircraft business or uh, aircraft activity which has been carried out? Now, when we look at the any association of person, I think we have to go back to 1960s and the landmark decision of Indira Balakrishnan of Supreme Court in 39 ITR page 546. I think that's a classic case and uh, whoever wants to understand what is AOP, I think that's the cases. Uh, I, I would always like to read and reread that decision of Indira Balakrishnan. What does that mean? Association of person means an association in which two or more persons join in for common purpose or common action to produce income or profit or gain. So therefore, what is required is common common action for the purpose of producing income or profits and gains now if the helicopter or uh, the uh, uh, the aircraft is owned by the two or three companies jointly are they joining together for the purpose of any common action to produce any income or profits and gains as per the case uh, uh, the question given to us it is used by themselves only it is not let out or it is not used for the commercial operations 
as has been uh, uh, been commonly used if you have to use it for commercial operations you have to take the several uh, authorities approvals before you start getting into the business of uh, aircraft operations because that has a separate uh, connotation separate things to be uh, organized so in limited to our question is this will not be treated as a aop it will be treated as ownership of asset and each one will be entitled to claim depreciation and set it off that depreciation against their other income so that's not the issue so that's the answer but just i will leave it one question for our participant to examine this uh, just to buy buy question to our side question to this suppose in this process if the aircraft is hired to outsider or any other group entities if not substantially but maybe for small percentage 10 percent 15 percent time will that be treated as a activity carried out jointly for the purpose of producing income or profits and gains or is it only to recoup the uh, 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 i would say a time which is not available to the actual user lying idle for recouping that idle time if they have temporarily used or given to somebody else for that purpose will it be treated as an aop or no my personal feeling is if it is not substantial activity of letting out to the outsiders but incidentally for suppose like a, i am just giving examples of tata group owns the aircraft or there are puna several bharat forge owners or kalani owns the aircraft now that aircraft is predominantly used by the promoters or that company or one or two joint owner of that company but if incidentally somebody says ame says i want to go from so and so to place to so and so place i hire it for one day will that 5 or 10 percent of time which is used for the unused uh, aircraft could it be as activity carried on so therefore according to me such incidental use cannot be treated as an activity systematically carried on by the company for forming it as a op so therefore that my personal view is it is possible to argue and good case but we should take care because this type of questions will come and in first place nobody will ask you the explanation they will just simply disallow and proceed further or treat it as association of person and proceed so therefore you have to be careful in planning your thing uh, so back to ame to you thank you thank you rajan bhai i think uh, uh, the co ownership uh, has been a model and uh, i think uh, as more and more businesses wants to sort of share the assets i think uh, this this trend will continue to remain uh, and it is in that context the the helicopter example was used but it can apply to any other asset as well but thank you rajan bhai uh, for those comments uh, uh, the next issue again very very uh, uh, significant issue in the current covid context uh, work from home and over last 12 months people have been working uh, from home and uh, any support from the employers uh you know for work from home how would it be taxed and uh, uh i request uh, pvs sir to uh, discuss this uh, interesting situation uh, the case study uh, refers to capital capitalization policy it has become a some kind of a model for it companies even if situation returns to normal uh, beyond covid some companies may continue to have this model of work from home because uh, there are certain advantages which both the employer and the employees get out of the new model of working so it will be more or less some kind of a work from home will become permanent as a feature not only in india possibly it will become globally so like where employer uh, uh, has a mix uh, the employee works from home he seeks some facility like some furniture some kind of a, a facility to work uh, so that he can work conducively in the environment and this is provided there's a budget which is 25000 i would think there's a reasonable budget it's not so uh, uh, liberal that you have to question the quantum of the expenditure the question is whether the asset is owned by the company or the asset is owned by the employee the case study suggests that the asset is owned by the company because it refers to capitalization policy it says this expense in the books because of the capitalization policy of the company so essentially it refers to ownership of the asset by the employer now when it once the asset is owned by the employer there are certain perquisite rules which have to be looked at because the perquisite rules for under rule 3 the rule 3 7 uh, clause 6 7 uh, has a use of asset related uh, perquisite it refers to perquisite as a benefit which is derived by the, for use of asset by an employee or a household 
Uh, it also calls out an exception for computers and laptops, which means that they are business assets, uh, but they could have some element of personal use. And uh, the nature of asset is that they are movable. They may move from office to home and home to office and so on and so forth. Unlike a computer or laptop, these assets like table and chair are unlikely to move every day out of office and back home. They will remain, uh, certainly they are movable within the classification, but they are not so mobile that like a computer. So, but nevertheless, they have the same attribute as a laptop or a computer. They are intended for official work and they are not intended for personal use. Uh, so I would think that the rule seven, sub clause seven would not be the right rule for this, though it does not make for all assets it says, but still the rule has to be read very carefully that it's for providing a benefit to the employee. That means there should be a benefit. Without a benefit, that rule would not come to application. So I would think that it's not a benefit which is being provided by the employer to the employee. Uh, but nevertheless, because these are tables, chairs, and other kind of furniture which is there, uh, they would possibly, uh, cap they are capital assets. The company may charge off as a capital policy uh, in the books for whatever reason. Uh, there can be some argument that they have a enduring benefit. This would be a matter of fact, whether the tables and chairs are disposable at short notice and as soon as or they are intended for long-term use, once you satisfy the enduring benefit, then it will uh, possibly uh, be a revenue expenditure. Uh, if it's not an enduring benefit, it can be claimed as a revenue expenditure, but they have some enduring benefit, then it would be only a depreciation that can be claimed and not a write-off under that Therefore, that would be the limitation. I would possibly think a little differently this kind of situation. It's not that the company will reacquire the assets from the employer at any point in time. Each table will be of different size, each chair will be of different size, different dimensions. I don't think the company will be able to accumulate all this furniture if the employee were to return them. They are all intended for the employees. That means at some point in time, they will also be intended for sale or transfer back to the employee. So I would possibly think, why not keep the ownership with the employee? You give a personal allowance as an allowance for the employee I let the ownership be with the employee himself so that he has an ownership and that he has a claim. We do have section 1014 that any allowance which is granted only in the performance of duties can be claimed as an exempt allowance. Uh, we have a city compensatory allowance uh, where which Mr. Palki Bala successfully argued before the law was changed that a yeah, city compensatory allowance essentially is only in the performance of duty that but for the nature of duty there would not be any need for those kind of uh, allowances uh, that are being located in the city itself and is the employment which brings into the city and therefore CCA is not taxable. I would think that those rationale would apply here too, that but for the requirement of work from home and the need that he must work in a conducive manner so that he does not have health hazards and he's able to discharge his functions quite well, he or she, let me be gender neutral, uh, then uh, you will find that uh, this may be a good idea to do at 1014 for the only reason that uh, we have to keep the GST complications also in mind. If you keep the asset as an asset of the company, the transfer of the asset to the employee also would require evaluation and other criteria. Though there's a valuation method which is prescribed on the Income Tax Act, the, that may not be easily acceptable under the GST. So I would possibly think a nominal allowance as long as the allowance is not excessive. When it comes to 1014, you have to meet only exclusively and necessarily. The question is whether the necessarily has to be in the context of in the context of the uh, performance of duty. The necessarily is not whether the asset was to be owned by the company or the asset should be owned by the employee. The necessity in the context of uh, performance of duty. That is how we have to read the necessity there. While 37.1 does not put necessity as a requirement, 10.14 puts a necessity as one of the requirements. I would read in the context of. I will possibly give an allowance and report the allowance in form 16 also uh, saying that is the gross amount of allowance is this much and the exempt amount is this much include it in the salary con uh, classification so it uh, uh, possibly addresses the gst concerns which may emanate at some point in time and it's also issue this is my humble solution uh, which i thought i'll provide you thank you uh, pvs sir i remember last year uh, all the it companies uh, and even uh, nascom did make a representation to the ministry about this but 
unfortunately we have not seen any clarification but uh, i think we must compliment the government and the ministry for yesterday's clarification uh, for medical assistance uh, and the ex gratia provided for covid treatment or the members of the families who are impacted by covid i think that's a welcome uh, change um moving on uh, to the next issue uh, dinesh bhai uh, uh, this is relating to the dividend taxation uh, dividends received by uh, the indian companies and uh, uh you know with the change in the dividend taxation in the last couple of years introduction of atm uh we thought it will be useful to relook at this issue with a fresh mind so dinesh bhai uh, over to you and again hopefully a, a, a relatively simple issue something which may not require a, a lot of time and will allow us to focus on some more other substantive questions uh two parts here uh when you when a company receives dividend from overseas uh and in turn declares a dividend before the due date which is one month before the due date for filing of the return uh atm deduction is available so atm is available both qua uh, indian dividend as well as qua foreign dividend so two questions here when a company has received dividend from overseas is atm available and second is if atm is available as a result of which whole or part of the dividend is therefore deductible then the question is whether foreign tax credit is available or not uh, uh the first point would be really that atm clearly is available the section merits no ambiguity uh, any foreign dividend is exigible to atm it needs to be borne in mind that atm is a deduction from gross total income and is not a deduction from dividend income and i think this is a very important thing to bear in mind so really so long as a company has got dividend and there is a gross total income which includes such a dividend then atm is available is foreign tax credit available and again to my mind the answer is yes foreign tax credit ought to be available because again as i mentioned atm is against gross total income uh the 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 dividend income continues to be part thereof and therefore foreign tax credit will be available however i can envisage three situations here a situation number one for example is that a company has got 100 by way of dividends from overseas has no other income whatsoever and 15 is a withholding rate which has been provided then there is no question of a foreign tax credit resulting in a refund and therefore really there is nothing which is available to you by way of a foreign tax credit a second situation could be that a company has a dividend income has in turn paid out dividend to its shareholders but has got other income on which taxes are payable but the taxes are not sufficient to absorb the entire withholding tax in which case the foreign tax credit would be restricted to the tax payable on such other income or so much of the dividend income as has not been paid out by way of a dividend and the final situation would be where dividends have been paid out there is other income and the tax on that other income is more than and can fully absorb the foreign tax credit in such a situation the entire foreign tax credit ought to be available as a deduction uh, i do not know whether this was intended left over uh, how did this happen but the fact of the matter remains as a important planning opportunity for all companies which are receiving overseas dividend back to you ahmed thank you thank you dinesh bhai uh, and uh, we'll continue the discussion forward with the foreign tax credit issue with pvs sir uh, taking over the next uh, uh, issue uh, again this is uh, a common situation that we see uh, especially with the indian companies um, uh, you know receiving uh, overseas income uh, pvs sir uh, question number 9 Yeah, this is a treaty country. There is the interest which is uh, being received. The domestic law in the foreign country requires a 15% withholding. The treaty requires a 10% withholding. By inadvertence or deliberate uh, deliberateness, the deduction is made applying the domestic law at 15%. The treaty is only 10%. The question is whether foreign tax credit will be available as per the treaty. to the extent of 10% or 15% the elimination of double taxation article clearly would say that the taxes has suffered in accordance with this convention therefore 
the convention would require 10 percent the 15 percent which is uh, suffered as a withholding in the foreign country uh, it will not be available fully it will be available only to the extent of 10 percent as far as the treaty is concerned rule 128 also uh, uh, possibly uh, endorses the same principle that the credit will be only to the extent the uh, tax is made in accordance with the convention the question is still there's a five percent excess tax which is suffered domestically it is as per law it is not that it is uh, out of the law and it's not a wrongful uh, withholding uh, if you go by the domestic law it's still a rightful withholding whether the extra five percent would be available as a deduction in computing the business profits of the company or the income of the company let me put it because it's interest it can have a different characterization too so uh, the uh, 40a1 explanation says that uh, to the extent the relief is available under uh, under section 90 or 91 that would not be eligible for relief certainly 10 as 10 is already deducted is already creditable that 10 is not available for deduction the question is whether balance 5 is available here again uh, i would possibly think that 40 uh, 48.2 does not re restrict the amount of deduction the explanation of 48.2 does not restrict the amount of deduction which is there uh, what is beyond the relief is eligible and it's a tax which is suffered as per the domestic law uh, so no doubt it could have been as long as the tax is not in dispute if it is in dispute it may require some kind of a, 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 a different approach but because it's not in dispute one would think that it would be eligible for a deduction under 37.1 because it does not fall exactly strictly into the disallowance factor under that except 37.1 also does not say as i mentioned earlier only and exclusively it does not say necessarily that means uh, if you cannot apply a new elastic that you need not have incurred these taxes if you had been more prudent you could have got it done at 10 percent rather than 15 percent those equations because many people are practical they don't want to fight the system they will not be in a position to educate the foreign withholder that the treaty would apply and not the domestic law should not apply all these things may be difficult in certain countries uh, so they will endure that loss thinking it's a business loss and they will accept the loss and it's a typical businessman's mind that it will well, that, that's how he will approach the problem 37.1 exactly also sits in the same uh, domain that he would allow that it would qualify for deduction i may also keep a reserve claim that okay if it does not qualify under 37.1 whether it will qualify under 28 itself can be one way of keeping it in mind whether uh, of course it uh, goes into a different kind of a, a justification which may be required for a loss but the fact that i certainly lost the money which is true and therefore that can be one alternate game this was a typical old old timers practice that 371 is uh, uh, can be somehow uh, uh, made over by 28 claim and uh, this can continue to uh, apply even here i would say so i will say that a deduction should be possible uh, relief under 90 should not be possible 91 relief also should not be possible because this is within the cover of the scope of the treaty the access covered there just because once the taxes is covered scope you cannot say excess tax will fall under 91 91 may not be eligible i would restrict it to only a deduction and a claim of 10 rupees as well thank you thank you pvs sir uh, uh, you know before we proceed uh, i want to make a request to all three of you uh, you know it's almost uh, uh, 650 we have uh, uh, you know allocated time till about seven o'clock uh, we are on question nine so my suggestion is perhaps we can take the next three questions uh, you know dealing with the personal tax related issues uh, they are they are logically coherent uh, as well and uh, maybe uh, you know after question number 12 we sort of uh, uh, pause or end our session so that we we are mindful of the uh, the time w would that be okay uh, for for all of you? Yes, absolutely. As a, as moderator says. <laughs> so I mean, we, we, we can go on, but uh, I think we, no, we should mindful. be mindful and uh, we should stick to the end time. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Whatever time uh, we start, we should end on time. No, no problem. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, the next three questions for all the. Uh, attendees, uh, we are dealing with some interesting scenarios relating to the individual tax uh, uh, situations. Uh, you know, non-resident Indians, the last year's deemed residency amendment, 
uh, and some COVID related situations and how to navigate uh, through those. The first situation uh, deals with the UAE treaty uh, and last year's deemed residency uh, amendment. And I request uh, Rajan Bhai to uh, take us through this uh, case study. Uh, thank you, Amir. So uh, you have given a challenging task to us, difficult question and limited number of words. We have to score the whatever time can be covered. Anyway, yeah. we'll so in take fact, my suggestion is my, my suggestion is instead of rushing through the remaining uh, questions, let us deal with uh, whatever we have properly. Uh, so that's the only point. Thank you. No, no, I fully agree with you. Yeah. So now I think what uh, you rightly said. I think there has been complete overall of section six, and uh, lighter when I always say. I do not know whether the lawmakers understood what changes they have made in the original bill, what they have made changes in the final act while passing the act, whether they have understood. And till today, at least I have not understood after reading again and again. And after receiving the question again, I try to read it again to whether I can uh, make some sense of what is the provision is. But more you read, you are more confused with the what is the amendments and applicability of as you rightly highlighted in the question is applicability or interplay between section 6 1a. And section 6 6. I think that's a crucial part. And when it comes to the treaty, how does the treaty work? Whether it will override treaty, not override treaty, that's another angle to which we need to consider. But the first, uh, let me just clarify the point. As, my, as far as my understanding is concerned, uh, section 6 does not override the treaty. So, therefore, a treaty will override and it will continue to govern if uh, you are following a treaty, whichever more beneficial, it will be applicable to the SEC. Only if it is beneficial, act is beneficial, he can fall act, otherwise he can continue to fall under the treaty. That's the fundamental question, uh, we, which we, a fundamental point which we need to keep in mind. Now, keeping that in mind, we need to understand what is six, section 61A and what are the changes made uh, in the whole amendments which are carried out. As far as one persons who are staying outside of India more than 182 days, they continue to be non resident So there is no dispute about it, there is no change made in that. If the person is going out of the country for the employment or for working on the ship again he has been excluded 182 days then he's again out of that so therefore that also is excluded the change made is in respect of persons who are coming back to india uh, uh, so therefore who are coming to coming to india or coming uh, coming in india or visiting india in that time now question is this is a uh, relaxation or um, amendment to section sub clause c of section 61 Sub clause C, as we know, it was containing two parts. One is if in the previous four years, in 365 days, if you are in India, plus during the previous year, previous year you are more than 60 days, then you are deemed to be resident in India. The relaxations of going out or coming in is relaxation to that condition which has been prescribed of section six uh, of 60 days. Now the amendment is made in respect of that section uh, and saying if you are coming to India or visiting India, then that. 60 days will get extended originally it was 180 days now it has been brought down to 120 days with one more catch added to that if you have in indian source income loosely i will re, uh, use the word indian source income of more than 15 lakhs rupees then this condition gets triggered this has to be read along with another condition of 21a a uh, 61a also along with the 6 and 66 so these are the three conditions, three sections which are to be read together. Now, section six, uh, uh, six one a has expanded the scope to everybody possible if he is a citizen of India. If he is a citizen of India, and if he has uh, not liable to tax in any other country, then he will be deemed to be citizen uh, who will be resident in India. I think that's a, a catch of the whole provision which we need to keep in mind. So in this situation. Person, uh, 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 if he is a citizen of India. Now, again, as I said, I have got confused more and more because if you see some sections of the same section six refers to person of Indian origin, but this section refers to only citizen of India. So that's another dimension to section, and which has impact. Which I'll, if I time permits, I'll touch upon that aspect why this has impact. So therefore, if he is a citizen of India and if he has no income uh, liable to tax, this was the final changes made in the uh, act. So if he has no income liable to tax in any other country for either residence, uh, domicile, residence, or any other condition, then he will be deemed to be a resident of India. Now, what does that mean? If he becomes a resident of India, will it mean that his world income becomes taxable in India? So this was the fear which was expressed. 
to take care of that fear they have amended section 6, uh, 6 sub clause 6 of section 6 and added two sub clauses that is c and d now what does the c says 6 reads with one explanation 1b which we referred to earlier so as per that section it says you will be deemed to be a resident however you will be resident but not ordinary resident and d says if you are a citizen of india who is deemed to be resident in india will also be deemed to be a not ordinary resident now these are the uh, 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 really facets of the same point and how it is to be dealt with we need to examine now considering this issue every indian source if person becomes a deemed resident either under 61a or under 61 uh, 61c with explanation will he become ta chargeable to tax in the entire world income that's the first question my uh, uh, my my uh, 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 view will be because of the restrictions carved out in section 6 6 sub clause c he will continue to be a resident but not ordinary resident therefore only indian sourced income will become chargeable to tax in india his foreign income will not be chargeable to tax in india unless it is from the business or profession controlled from india or managed from india without getting into much in detail because that's the topic by itself again but merely saying if he is a deemed resident either under 61a or under 61c then he will be resident but not ordinary resident therefore his foreign income will be not become chargeable to tax in india. that's a fundamental which we need to keep in mind and proceed further now keeping that in mind let us examine our case indian this person of uh, indian citizen of india he is a resident of uae he is in dubai uh, he is in uae for 200 days in previous year as per uh, uh, article 41a of india U U uae treaty he becomes a resident of uae if he is more than 182 days outside of india uh, he is uh, 182 days in that country so since he is in that country he as per the treaty becomes a resident of uae so therefore once he is a resident of uae as per treaty which overrides the section 6 he will not be treated as deemed income a deemed resident or uh, any other resident under section 6 so therefore his income will not be chargeable to tax in india except to the extent of indian sourced income his foreign income would not be chargeable to tax in india at all so that's a short answer to the query which is there detail answer could be a topic by itself but i don't want to get into a longer answer but time being since he's a resident of uae his india source income will be chargeable to tax in india subject to i'll come to the last sub question b which is there i'll come to that question but subject to that his uae income which is not taxed in uae will not be chargeable to tax in india that's a simple answer to our query now uh, question is if a non-resident of india or cities a resident of uae holds certain income in india india source income like capital gain interest and everything will he be eligible for treaty benefit and low rate of tax yes he will be eligible for as per the treaty whatever is low rate of tax for the uae resident he will be eligible to claim even though he is a indian citizen so merely because he is indian citizen will not debar him for the exemptions if he is eligible for to be treated as a resident of uae as per the treaty so that's the answer to second question i will just leave one point for consideration of all of you if person is it suppose in the uae person is not there for 200 days but he is there only for 150 days so he is not resident of uae what will be his taxation in india because he squarely falls in 61c if he falls in 61c what will be implications of 61a and section and section uh, 66c i think i leave it to the consideration of the participants but that's a very interesting question because he is not a resident of UAE. He is a resident, becomes a deemed resident of India. And then what are the complications? The last point which I'd like to touch, if he becomes a resident, but not ordinary resident, but and not the non-resident, then he will have to make a disclosures, which is required to be given in the returns, which is <coughs> necessary for foreign asset disclosure. 
and which is very very become se very severe uh, condition so you for if you for any reason because of 150 days or any condition you have become resident but not on resident you are still liable to declare your for assets that's the point i reply to your point back to you Amir. thank you thank you rajan bhai uh, very interesting uh, uh, nuanced answer uh, but uh, but but very useful uh, as well uh, dinesh bhai uh, uh, you know, the we next, also point uh, we are reaching seven o'clock. Uh, 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 I, I think my suggestion is maybe we can consider the new next two case studies, like I said, okay. eleven and two, very briefly, uh, and okay. then so let, maybe in the five minutes. Okay, let yeah. me try and answer the the next question as quickly as one can. It's a, it's a very okay. interesting question. We are dealing with a, a person whose employer is Chinese who has come to India, who because of COVID is rendering services to the Chinese company, but sitting from out of India. Uh, uh, the, the question says that on account of the visa terms, the taxes are paid in, in China. I presume that what it should read is that the Chinese domestic law does permit such a taxation, and I'm presuming that to be the case. And then the question is that since the person is in India, the person is resident but not ordinarily resident in india would such salary income be liable to tax in india and if so would the taxes paid in china be available for credit against indian uh, taxes which are payable uh, we have a very interesting situation if you if you look at the provisions first is we have the U un and the oecd commentary which categorically provides that services are deemed to be rendered where an employee is situated so unlike in the case of digital taxation where a lot of changes have happened insofar as the individual taxation is concerned the un and the oecd commentary provide that employment is exercised where the employee is physically located and therefore it is deemed that the employment is exercised in india if you look at article 11 of the uh yeah, sorry article 15 of the india china tax treaty which deals with independent personal services the person is in india for more than 183 days independent personal services article will not apply the whole income will be liable to tax in india and then the question arises is that under article 23 which deals with elimination of double taxation will the person get a credit for taxes paid in china and the question would be that a person who is a not ordinary resident and who is liable to tax in India on the salary income because the employment is exercised in India, could you say that the taxes paid in China is in accordance with the provisions of the DTAA? And it could be a very big challenge to contend that such taxes are paid in accordance with DTAA, such taxes are paid in accordance with the domestic laws of China, and therefore, there is a real possibility that a person would end up paying taxes both in China uh, and in India. The question deals with uh, 234 BC. All of those are conse uh, consequential issues. But clearly, the person is liable to tax in both the countries. And the limited point I would make is that when, as I said, OECD has, uh, and G7 and everybody has dealt with permanent establishment and, and, and whatever constitutes a permanent establishment, digital presence, etc. Would it really be not the case that in a situation like that, depending, of course, on the type of work that a person does, but if the work is done electronically and the services are all rendered to the Chinese company, should you say that the employment is exercised in India where the employee is physically present or where the services are received? A lot of law needs to evolve here. But back to you, Ame. Thank you. I just try Thank to you. keep it short rather than to make it long. Thank you. Sorry. Appreciate. Uh, I think. Uh... Uh, that sort of sums up the issue very well and uh, the next situation is actually the converse of uh, the current situation uh, and pvs sir uh, uh, you know again uh, you know your thoughts simple, on simple case study simple case study expat is employed by an indian company he is normally work up, work required to work in india due to covid he is stuck in uh, uk he is in his home in uk and he is rendering services from uk and he is not able to return to india the question is whether he still draws salary from the Indian company. The contract of employment is with the Indian company and they are executed in India. This is a, a brief facts. The question is, is a non-resident 
president for this year in India because he is required to stay in the UK due to COVID conditions and work from home. Uh, taxability is what is being looked at. Uh, I may look at it. He is non-resident in India is a given fact. He has not stayed in India for 183 days. That's one. The next question is whether he is a resident of UK. Uh, possibly we may have to test it. UK has certain exceptional circumstances which are carved out. Certain days we are allowed to stay in UK, but still it will not be counted for the purpose of determination of uh, uh, the residential status. Uh, my presumption in this case is that he meets those exceptional circumstances. So UK would carve it out and UK also may treat him as a non-resident. So two countries don't want to treat him as resident. India doesn't want to treat him as resident and UK also does not want to treat him as a resident. The question is, uh, still he is performing services. UK has one peculiar uh, uh, fact which we may understand only in the context of UK it could be true for many other countries is that if you have spent more than three hours a day it's considered a working day in the UK. That means if you have worked for three hours a day then it would be a working day in the UK. UK. That means uh, this person since he is working from home and all the days he is working from home presumably for each of the days beyond three hours I would count each of them as rendition of service in UK. So he meets the performance of service or rendition of service in uh, UK in physical terms. So his compensation as per UK law will be liable to because it's so no doubt the performance criteria has met. The only question we have to ask is which source is of greater weight. The contract of employment in India is a higher weight or the performance of service in UK is of higher weight. I would possibly think based on the international principle which Mr. Uh, Anabar also cited just one, uh, one, uh, one minute before that performance of service determines the source higher than the contract of employment uh, which is considered in India. So it would be liable to tax in UK and if UK, UK wants to tax it can tax it. India it may not be liable to tax, he may not be able to press the article uh, 16 uh, because he is not a resident of UK to press for that article. But on first principles, he can argue that it's not liable to tax. Uh, Section 6, sub, uh, subclass 2, I think, would may help you. Uh, uh, self, uh, Section 9, subclass 2 may help you to say that income earned in India is when services are rendered in India. A converse situation also must be inferred, can be one of the principles. So, this is what is the problem, I think, is a statement. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Thank you, PVS, sir. And uh, uh, thank you. I to, mean, before yeah. you uh, before yes. you wind up, uh, only two quick uh, answer. One minute, I will just give the answer to question number 13 and question number 15. It won't take more than a minute. For question number 13, the question is, uh, is it required for me to go every time to the officer to ask for a lower deduction under 195.2? There is a direct decision of Prasad Production which answers this question, 125 ITA 263 Chennai Special Bench, and which has been followed in all subsequent decisions. And according to me, it can be, you can go charter account certificate under uh, 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 which you are permissible uh, uh, as per the circular and as per the rules 37 EE read with 15 CA and CB. So therefore, you don't have to go to the officer to direct tax. So that is the will short answer to that. And question number 15, I think very important question. When a non-resident makes a payment to a resident, whether he's supposed to be governed by the Indian laws for the purpose of deduction, uh, I would say the prima facie uh, there was not required in the past because there was circular, but after the insertion of explanation 2 to section 195.1, along with the word of phone amendment, that scope has been extended to the law. How will government of, so that theoretically it is applicable, but how will government of India enforce against non resident Nobody knows. But that law, as it says, it is supposed to be uh, uh, comply with the law. And last is last but not the least, thank you very much, uh, Amir, for the excellent questions. Uh, thank you, Drishti, for the excellent uh, coordination and giving us opportunity also to be with Dinesh and uh, PVS. So it was a great opportunity to share our thoughts and study and test our brains for the purpose of uh, studying this point. Thank you very much. Likewise, I mean, Dristi, thank you so much. A uh, lot of work has gone into it. Uh, and and, and uh, whilst we had to squeeze some of the answers or make some of the answers lengthy, I hope it was worth all the participants' time. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Samaya. Thanks a lot. This, this is the question paper for CA final students, possibly next time. Said <laughs> <laughs> <Dead> by <Ame. laughs> Said by uh, so thank so you so to all and uh, Drishti, over to you for uh, the final concluding comments. Yes, 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 yes. So first of all, I would like to say that today was really a, it was really a treat for everyone, I'm sure. 
this was like the kind of questions which ame uh, had uh, set up with everybody's inputs and i think it was so fantastic uh, i really enjoyed listening to all of it and uh, each question as i think uh, each question is a, a proper full full fledged opinion uh, i'm sure this is something which is a very rare thing that you would uh, be able to witness all the audience the audience here has greatly benefited from the uh, you know the time that you have spared for all of us and for the benefit of members uh, so first of all i would like to thank all the panelists uh, rajan sir dinesh sir pvs sir uh, it was so kind of you to spare so much time and uh, we had so many uh, pre meets also for uh, this discussion and it was so fantastic thank you so much for sparing your valuable valuable time and above all i would like to thank ame the kind of you know effort that he has put in and the type of questions and the case studies that you have I mean, you have taken out it was fantastic i'm sure it was one of the best brain trust that i have witnessed uh, till now thank you so much for this wonderful thing that you could you know give for the members here uh, and along with uh, uh, myself there are so many who have worked we have uh, my entire wrc team which has worked along with uh, me on this and they backed up every time if something was not possible so i would like to thank all of my wrc uh, team members for making this entire program such a wonderful success uh, i also would like to thank the back office uh, staff subhash and vaibhav and they have put in so much effort they have seen to it that everything goes absolutely seamlessly everybody here the panelists would fully agree that they have done fantastic job and without them it would not have been possible to do this uh, so i wish everyone a very very happy uh, weekend and I, i i definitely believe that you will relish your experience uh, of dtrc and today's session especially uh, for uh, a long time and you'll be able to watch this later on maybe after 10 10 days uh, this will be also uploaded on the youtube channel so this program i'm sure will have a lot of viewership even going forward because this has to be seen several times to understand quite a few of the questions with this i thank you all very much for being here and being part of ctrc thank you very much thank you thank you and with this we uh, bring the program to close the entire series thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.